Councilmember Sanchez, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm not. I just want to make sure y'all know I can't mute and unmute myself. Yes, we will unmute you when there is a question answer. Good afternoon. Session. Good afternoon. At this time, can the host please start the webinar? Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Education. At this time, can everyone please silence your cell phones? If you wish to testify today, please come up to the sergeant's desk so you can and fill out one of these testimony slips. Written testimony can be emailed to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you and welcome all to today's hearings. Good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing on DOE's new admissions process. I'm Rita Joseph, Chair of the Education Committee. Thank you to everyone present here today and those of you who are testifying remotely. At today's hearings, we will, hear also, we will also hear testimony on the following legislation, introduction 338 and introduction number 403, both which I am proud to sponsor and Resolution 129, sponsored by Councilmember Botcher. We will hear more about this legislation shortly. In September, DOE announced several changes to its admissions process. And, here, and we are here today to learn more about how these changes were made and their potential impacts on our students. Before discussing these changes, I will provide brief background of previous admissions process. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic caused severe disruptions in instruction and canceled state testing, causing the previous administration to issue a pause on the use of all screens for middle school admissions for 2021 and 2022. And 2023 school year admissions, 2022, 2023 school year with students selected through a lottery based in system instead. Those screens remained at high school levels as of spring 2022, screens programs no longer considered state standardized test scores and last year's admissions criteria at at least 85 average for students to qualify for priority access to screen schools. During the time of these revised admissions policies, DOE schools saw, saw some progress towards integrating the largest and most diverse, yet one of the most segregated school districts in the country. According to DOE, after removing screens, students from low-income families who were matched to in-demand middle schools rose to 48% and an increase of seven percentage points. Selective high schools throughout the city saw similar changes. At the city's 27 highest performing screen schools, 40% students accepted last year were black and Latino, up from 28% in 2020. In September, DOE announced changes to the middle school admissions process, allowing each superintendent, district superintendent to consult with their community to decide whether or not they wanted to keep middle school screen programs for the upcoming school year. I am proud of the decisions of many superintendents who continue to make positive steps towards integration. With only 59 middle schools reinstating screenings down significantly from 196 middle schools that screened students before the pandemic. However, there is still work to be done. DOE also announced more restrictive high school admissions criteria for screen program, which will restrict top tier admission priority to students who final seventh grade point average at least 90, per 90 and fall in the highest performing 15% of, of their school or citywide. This change will sub substantially reduce the pool of those eligible for top tier priority next year. When making changes to high school admissions criteria for screen programs, did DOE consider how this significant drop in students receiving first priority will impact integration efforts in our city's top high schools? In addition, last April, the administration unveiled a plan to expand gifted and talented programs, adding 100 kindergarten seats and 1,000 third grade seats citywide. However, many crit critiques contend that GNT program contribute to a segregated system, citing lack of diversity. As we look to the future, how do we ensure that these new programs do not historically segregate the past? 
The benefit of school diversity to all children are undeniable, which is what led to Council 10 TAC Local 225 of 2019 mandating the establishment of that di district diversity working group in every community school district. Though DOE began the phasing of district diversity working group after this law was intact, the current status of these working groups is unknown. How many districts have established working groups thus far? What efforts, if any, is DOE making to expand the working group model to all districts? These are some of the questions the committee would like to answer at today's hearing. Furthermore, we'd like to learn more about centralized My Schools application portal, which now covers admission from three to, three to K to high school, including GNT admissions, while centralized My School application process is meant to simplify the admissions process. The online portal has a history of creating headaches for families, with most recently the website crashed the night before the December 1st deadline. The portal also presents challenges for families who cannot read, lack access to a computer, or familiar with technology. As a result, critics charge that the complicated process contribute to the city's status as one of the most segregated school system in the country. I want to thank everyone who is testifying today. I want to thank the city council staff as well as my own for all of their work they put in for today's hearing. I'd like to remind everyone who wishes to testify today must fill out a witness slip which is located at the desk of the sergeant at arms near the entrance room to allow as many people as te possible to testify. Testimonies will be limited to three minutes per person whether you're testifying on Zoom or in person. I'm also going to ask my colleagues to limit their questions and comments to five minutes. Finally, I look forward to hearing testimony on my two bills, Introduction 338, which is establishing a bully intervention task force, and Introduction 403, which is a bill to distribute IDNYC applications to all high school students. We will also hear from resolution number 129, calling on DOE to carry instruction on bike safety in all New York City schools. Before, I'd like, before I begin, I'd like to also acknowledge my colleagues, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Ong, Council Member Vernikoff, Council Member Menning, Councilmember Botcher, Councilmember Dinowitz, Councilmember Abreu, Councilmember Lee, and Councilmember Hanif. And um, on remotely, um, Councilmember Shulman and Councilmember Sanchez. Um, I would like to turn to Councilmember Botcher for quick remarks on Resolution 129. Thank you so much, Chair Joseph, uh, for holding this hearing today on my resolution calling upon the Department of Education to fulfill its obligation to offer bicycle safety instruction in all schools. Uh, cycling has grown in popularity a lot in recent years, and uh, certainly in my uh, 20 years in New York, it's become more and more popular. But that growth hasn't been accompanied by any meaningful bike safety education in schools. At a time when more and more young people are getting on bikes, it's so important that they be taught the rules of the road and how to ride safely and responsibly. And I think my, you know, my colleagues can agree that we've all heard more and more concerns uh, from constituents about cyclist behavior, riding on the sidewalks, and, and other kinds of things like that. We've got to provide safe infra infrastructure for cyclists. We have to ensure that the rules are enforced, but we also have to teach young people starting at an early age about the benefits of cycling and the rules around cycling. New York State education law requires that all school districts teach bike safety in schools. Not many people know that, but very few schools, we believe anecdotally, are teaching bike sa safety education. That's why I introduced this resolution in partnership with Councilmember Joseph and Sylvina Brooks Powers and really appreciate this opportunity to bring light to this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Botcher. And of course, I'm your partner in this. Um, I'd also like to recognize Councilmember De La Rosa and um, now turn it over to committee council. Good afternoon, everyone. I will now administer the oath. Um, <clears throat> 
Daniel Weisberg, Sarah Kleinler, Kleinhandler, Nadia Halafi Chada, and Kenyatta Reed. I would call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these, this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Daniel Weisberg? I do. Sarah Kleinhandler? I do. Nadia Halafi Chada? Um, and Kenyatta Reed. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to the chair. Or Thank you. You may start. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Joseph and uh, council members. Uh, um, grateful to you for holding this hearing on uh, these, these important issues. Uh, I'll start with some good news, which is my opening remarks will be very brief, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Sarah Kleinhandler. Um, uh, my name is Dan Weisberg. I'm the first deputy chancellor of New York City Public Schools. I'm very pleased to be here today with our chief enrollment officer, Sarah Kleinhandler, <coughs> and her chief deputy, N Nadia Chada, uh, as well as other talented members of our team. Uh, in a moment, I will turn it over to uh, uh, chief enrollment officer Kleinhandler, who will speak in greater depth about our admissions processes and policies. Before she does, I just want to talk briefly about our broad vision for our school system as a whole. It is our fundamental belief and guiding principle that every student can achieve excellence and every school has the capacity to make that happen. We just need to support them in getting there, both our schools and our students. I often say that brilliance is everywhere. Brilliance is in all of our neighborhoods, it's in all of our schools, it's in all of our students. Opportunity, unfortunately, is not. Our entire administration is focused on uplifting all schools and all students. In order to accomplish this, the Chancellor has laid out his four pillars that are guiding our efforts to reimagine New York City public schools and the student experience. Ch Chancellor Banks' first pillar, and our, probably our most important pillar, is community engagement. And that has been central to our work since the beginning, and, and it is a value that's reflected clearly in our policy making about admissions. These policies are not designed to reflect one particular ideology or to find a one-fits-all solution that doesn't exist, but to facilitate a system that is responsive to our families and communities to the greatest possible extent. Chancellor Banks and I strongly believe in the power of diversity in our schools. On a personal level, I'm not only the proud product of the New York City Public Schools, but I was blessed, truly blessed, to have attended integrated schools where my classmates and friends were white, black, Latino, Latina, Asian, low income, high income, and everywhere in between. I understood at a young age the fundamental truth that di differences among us are the engines of creativity, laughter, and brilliance. And that understanding has been the foundation for my entire career in education. Research reflects the tangible and important benefits of diversity in our schools, higher graduation rates, higher test scores, but also helping students to become more civically minded and tolerant. So we're committed to supporting integration efforts that are community driven by and for families. It is the only way these that these efforts truly succeed at a local level. And we're not gonna wait for integration to progress across our communities before we act. Our main focus is to ensure that all of our city schools are high quality, responsive to the needs and demands of local communities and our students and families. This is our charge and one the Chancellor has repeatedly made clear. And with that, once again, thank you, Chair Joseph and members of the committee, and I'll turn it over to Chief Enrollment Officer Sarah Klein-Handler for her remarks. Good afternoon, Chair Joseph and members of the Education Committee here today. My name is Sarah Kleinhandler, and I'm the Chief Enrollment Officer for New York City Public Schools. I am joined here today by Nadia Chada, Senior Director for Strategic Affairs in my office. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the admissions process for the New York City Public Schools and the work of the Office of Student Enrollment. Before I begin, I'd like to share a little about my background. I've been with the Department of Education for 26 years. I began my career in October 1996 as a high school English teacher at Louis D. Brandeis High School in District 3. I was hired in October in response to the long line of students wrapped around the building for the first two months of school waiting for placement. 
The image of the line of students replicated itself year after year. Later, I became the assistant principal at Life Sciences Secondary School, then a literacy, literacy instructional specialist, and eventually came to the Office of Student Enrollment, where I oversaw the launch of our online applications and wait lists while striving to make the experience a fair and better one for families and schools. Even now, I remember the line of students around the building and keep that in mind as I think about the enrollment experience I want families to have. The Office of Student Enrollment manages admissions and enrollment for over 300,000 students each year. We run the admissions processes for 3K, Pre-K, Kindergarten, Gifted and Talented, Middle School, and High School. Our 12 Family Welcome Centers support families who are newly arrived to New York City and need a school placement, as well as families who need a transfer or require other enrollment help. The Office of Student Enrollment also oversees the P301 Call Center, and we have teams dedicated to outreach and enrollment for special populations like students with disabilities and students in temporary housing. We offer services to families in multiple languages. To put it simply, our goal is to make applying to school simple, easy, and intuitive for families at every grade level. From the moment Chancellor Banks took office a little over a year ago, he laid out a vision for New York City public schools that included engaging families to be our true partners. That commitment to community engagement has driven everything happening in our school system, particularly when it comes to our admissions policies and processes. Over the last year, the Office of Student Enrollment has renewed our investment in community engagement to listen critically and implement suggestions and feedback from families where we can. This past spring, we launched a listening tour with the purpose of soliciting ideas and perspectives on how to best improve the admissions process, hosting over 30 meetings with a variety of stakeholders, including parents and community and advocacy groups, school leaders, school staff, and students. I don't know if, you, if all of you have the deck, but if you do, if you turn to slide two, you can find more details about the groups we've heard from. While not perfect, we have made engagement and feedback an integral part of our work rather than just paying lip service to it. For many parents, admissions is the first contact they have with New York City public schools, so it is essential that we make the enrollment process accessible and seamless. Tackling the Chancellor's vision of reimagining the student experience must start with admissions. Family feedback has prompted many immediate and tangible improvements in our processes. Specifically, as highlighted on slide three, after two years of extremely delayed timelines, the middle school and high school admissions applications were opened earlier this year. An earlier application launch means earlier offers for families, which this year is early spring. This timeline enables schools and families to more easily plan and ask questions of the schools their children will be attending. Relatedly, we publicly released the dates of application openings in advance so that schools and families could plan and prepare for open houses, research schools, and apply on time. As always, all our resources are available in multiple languages. To make the application and admissions process more transparent and intuitive, we launched a citywide events calendar within, my, within the MySchools application system, which is available in the nine top DOE languages. Every school in our system is encouraged to use the calendar to advertise and attract students and families to open houses, information sessions, and more. There are currently over 3,400 events listed across all our admissions processes. The calendar is searchable by grade span and can be filtered to each family's needs. We also made other improvements in, in my schools, including improving the online tool for submitting auditions to schools, a shift in practice that happened during the pandemic. This year, families received an email confirming their successful upload, as well as a receipt for all types of submissions. For middle and high school, we added more information to each school and program in, to each school and program's My School page, including a filter for applicants per seat, which helps families search for low, middle, and high demand programs as they build a balanced application. After offers are released, families are added to waitlists or can use waitlists to find another school option. When waitlists open this spring, we will display information about how many waitlist offers were made by school in the past, giving families more context about their waitlist position. Additionally, this past year, we extended waitlists to close in September so that any open seats are filled fairly and transparently. 
we will continue to implement improvements on an ongoing basis to make the admissions process as straightforward and family-centered as we can. The family feedback we received also led to, led to changes in the middle and high school admissions process. For middle school, which you can find on slide four, fifth grade families have long had the opportunities to apply to a range of middle school options, typically within their local community school district. Prior to the pandemic, many programs admitted students through random selection, while others chose students based on their academic records, which is called screening. During the pandemic, there was a citywide pause on, on screening at middle school because there was inadequate academic data to enable schools to, to select students. Now that students have by and large returned to the norm, Chancellor Banks asked each superintendent to conduct engagement in their communities, including their CECs, principals, families, and others to determine if and where middle school screened programs should resume based on the district's instructional and community needs. Some ultimately kept their districts completely unscreened while others selected a few schools to be screened based on historical practice and community feedback. As a result of their thoughtful engagement, each district has a tailored admissions process that has brought the overall number of screens with academic schools with academic screens down to 59 from 196 prior to the pandemic. This robust process ensured that decisions about middle school screens reflected local needs and were communicated to families in advance of the middle school application opening in October. Moving to high school as summarized on slide five, we have more than 700 programs across 400 schools for students to apply to. Each year, eighth graders can apply to as many as 12 schools. Like middle schools, high schools have different admissions methods. Most are open programs where the only thing a family needs to do is apply to the school and students are then selected randomly. Others, so-called ed op programs, select randomly but aim to admit an academically mixed group of students by prioritizing a portion for, for students from each academic group. In addition, there are approximately 120 high schools that use screening admitting students based on their academic record and sometimes additional school-based assessments such as an essay or portfolio. Historically, each screened high school had its own criteria for admissions and conducted its own evaluation process, which was confusing for families. During the pandemic, the DOE moved schools to a simplified screening process using more standardized criteria. There was also a shift away from having schools handle their own ranking of students and instead had the My School System rank students automatically. Families have told us that those simplifications made admissions easier and more transparent, so we've kept it in place. Last year, screened high schools admitted students in groups, with top performing students in group one being admitted first, then lower performing students in group two being admitted next, and so on. Under last year's screening criteria, approximately 60% of the applicants fell into group one. In our engagement around admissions, we heard from many stakeholders that the criteria for the top group was not stringent enough for screened programs, inadequately rewarding some students for their hard work. At the same time, we heard the shift to standard admissions criteria helped make the process simpler to navigate. In addition, the group admissions method resulted in greater diversity and representation at some of our most in-demand high schools. These are not easy decisions to make. We, look at our pro we looked at our process last year, took the feedback, and adjusted the high school process specifically for screen schools. We modified the criteria for the screening process so that this year, any student who is in the top performing 15% of their school or the top 15% of the city is included in group one. This change narrowed the top group to about 20% of students. At the same time, it preserved access for students from every middle school across the city, allowing for greater diversity at screened programs com compared to before the pandemic. As you can see in the chart on slide five, we anticipate the demographics of the students in group one to be similar to previous years. Thanks to the feedback we received from families and our ability to make these changes in early fall, we were able to move up the timelines for both processes. High school offers will be released in March, and middle school offers will be released in April. In the past two cycles, offers were released in late spring and early summer, 
which left little time for families and schools to prepare before the end of the school year. In addition to a more thoughtful process, Chancellor Banks believes firmly that while there are academically brilliant children in every neighborhood, many students have to travel long hours to reach academically accelerated learning high schools. To fill that gap, in some underserved communities of color, three new accelerated learning academies will be opened in fall 2024, informed by community needs. These schools will be located in the South Bronx, Ocean Hill Brownsville, and Southeast Queens. As with middle and high school, for kindergarten and gifted and talented admissions, we strove for greater simplicity and access. For years, there were two distinct processes for kindergarten and gifted and talented admissions, which resulted in two different offers on two different timelines, creating more work and uncertainty for families. Recognizing an opportunity for simplification by combining the two applications, we surveyed a representative group of pre-K parents and received more than 600 responses. The majority of those surveyed were in favor of combining the applications, which will allow us to make offers to families sooner. We hope that combining these processes will raise awareness of a variety of kindergarten offerings to all applicants and simplify the admissions experience. Once families apply for G&T, children are evaluated either by their current pre-K teacher or by staff from the Division of Early Childhood Education using a nomination tool that reviews gifted qualities. These changes are building on the expansion of gifted and talented seats that was introduced last year in response to DOE's engagement with diverse group of parents and community stakeholders. This administration added 100 kindergarten seats and 1,000 third grade G&T seats, expanding both entry points to all districts. With all of these changes, we are making significant strides towards a more equitable and accessible system. Finally, for 3K and Pre-K, we will continue to work with our partners in the Early Childhood Division to ensure that we are capturing feedback and, just, and adjusting where we can. We are glad to announce that both applications open this morning, and as with other grade bands, interested families may apply to up to 12 choices. There are a range of seat types for 3K and Pre-K, such as full day seats, which are available to all applicants, as well as extended day and year or Head Start seats, which are only available to families that qualify based on need or income. Every Pre-K applicant receives an offer. I will now turn to the proposed legislation. Intro 0403 would require the Department of Education to distribute information on and applications for IDNYC to all high school students. We support the goal of this legislation and look forward to working with the council on it. Intro 0338 establishes a bullying prevention task force. The Department of Education is committed to ensuring that schools are places where all students feel safe, welcomed, and supported. Our Office of Safety and Youth Development has been deeply invested in this work, including through ongoing collaboration with community stakeholders, and we have made significant progress, so we look forward to further conversations and working with Council on this bill. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the DOE and my team in the Office of Student Enrollment for all of the work they have put into making the enrollment experiences for newly arriving students as seamless as possible. We have had staff at the Navigation Center, hotels, and our Family Welcome Centers available to counsel and support thousands of newly arriving families in their language so their children can, be, can, can begin attending school immediately. I'm proud to be on their team. Thank you for this opportunity to share our improvements to the admissions processes over the past year. As I said earlier in the testimony, we are looking forward to continuing our practice of engaging with communities throughout the year to ensure that we are responding thoughtfully to community needs. We plan to hold more listening sessions with families and community groups in collaboration with the DOE's family and community engagement arm so that we can continue to improve and provide the best possible admissions process for our students. We welcome the council's feedback and questions as always. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take the moment to recognize um, Council Member Felice, Council Member Narcisse, Council Member H Hanks, Aviles. Thank you. So thank you. 
How does the DOE communicate changes to its admissions process, particularly those for middle school and high school to prospective students and their families? How do you know that the information is getting out to all parents? Family fa we, we hold family-facing information sessions with interpretation in all nine top DOE home languages. And these sessions provide an overview of the process and opportunity to ask questions. We have a number of tutorials on our website to guide families through the My Schools experience, how to make decisions about what schools to apply to and other key needs. We publish all of the changes on our website, which is translated in all nine languages. We send dozens of emails, which are also translated through the process to all families who have signed up for our updates or have My Schools accounts. We send welcome letters to all fifth grade families um, to help them set up a My Schools account. For eighth graders, most of those families already had My Schools accounts, and if they don't, we work with their schools to get them set up. We work with superintendents to disseminate information to CECs and other community members. We attend community meetings like advocacy councils and CECs to provide information and answer questions. And most importantly, for middle and high school admissions, we provide robust trainings for all school staff and counselors as they are the main support for families in navigating the admissions processes, and counselors are given presentations and guidance to support them in the work. Families, of course, can also visit all of our 12 family welcome centers or call our call center, and of course, there's, there are language supports there to help those families. Okay, so now you, we discuss the process, the changes. How was that communicated to the families? The same way we, we sent, well, when we, met with, when we met with and talked with the advocacy groups um, and community-based organizations, we had them help us get the word out. We also have all of that information on our website. We also to told all of our superintendents and schools, and we rely on them heavily to share with their school communities as well. And a parent who has no access to technology, a parent who does not, English is not their first language, how is that communicated to them as well? And let's say I am a parent that does not speak English. What if I don't read my native language? You also have to keep that in mind as well. So we've been flexible with application deadlines for sure. Um, we never find fault with family who has an who has a issue with our system or our processes. Um, we provide extra support with school staff to remind them about how to provide families with login information. We rely heavily on the guidance counselors at schools, and we use our Family Welcome Center counselors as well to help, na to help families navigate the process. And um, what were you, who were your CBO partners on the ground that was helping you get this message out? Um, I, have a, I have the S. Um, specifically, it, it is, it's, it's, in the, it's in the deck that I gave. Um, our CBO partners are NYI, NYIC, Advocates for Children, PLACE, the Ferex Center, Appleseed, CACF, of course our UFT counselors, um, CCHS, and Integrate NYC, to name a few. Um, I know at one point you guys are used to be really on the ground doing grassroots reach, outreach to parents. Is that model still being used inside the DOE as we've seen families have changed drastically over the years? We do, we do use the on-the-ground method to reach out to families. Um, we also use our family welcome centers, and um, we rely heavily on superintendents and their staff as well to help us get the word out. Okay, I'll come back. Um, so what steps have been taken to provide adequate support and resources to families navigating this new admissions process? Um, have you increased guidance counselors? Um, have you invested in after-school programming from navigating middle school and high school admissions? Also, has the DOE invested in professional development for guidance counselors and school leaders on topic on how to navigate this new process? Um, in terms of um, guidance counselors, um, so the Office of Student Enrollment doesn't oversee guidance counselors. Um, we, so that is not in our purview. So hiring counselors is part of school staffing. Someone is talking. Can you please keep it down? Thank you. Um, 
In terms of investing in after school programming for navigating middle school and high school admissions, um, I think that's a great idea. Um, some programs do exist at the school level um, and we work with staff there to support them, but that certainly is something that we would consider moving forward. Um, and in terms of professional development, my office provides extensive training to schools and to counselors around admissions processes and we always make ourselves available if schools or communities need additional support. Can you please bring the mic a little closer to you? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. We, I heard you say that um, guidance counselors are not in your preview. Who's, who's, uh, whose leadership is that under and how can we, how can that get out to the schools where middle school and high school process, this is where the guidance counselor support comes in a lot and supporting the parents. How do we get more guidance counselors in there to help them navigate this new system that you set up? Um, I apologize, Chair, I'm not sure I heard all, all of the question, but you know, the, the, um, uh, the funding for guidance counselors and social workers, as you know, has, has been increased so that we ha see an increased number system-wide. The deployment of guidance counselors and the training largely is going, it feeds up to superintendent's offices. And, you know, one of the um, accountabilities for superintendents is, and one of the most important ones is family satisfaction. So, you know, we are looking at additional ways and would love to work with you and, and, and the committee on what are ways to uh, get the feedback if, for example, um, parents who speak languages other than English are not getting the information easily, don't know where to go to get the information. That's something we should know uh, centrally, but probably more importantly, superintendents need that information so they can figure out how to deploy the resources they have uh, more effectively to the communities that, that are involved. So, but most of those decisions about uh, how to deploy to counselors are gonna be made uh, at, the, at the school level and then at the superintendent level. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, in what way does DOE assist non-English speaking families with admissions processes? What does DOE provide information in paper form as well as online ease of access? At what school level, who's in charge of doing outreach proactively? Is there a number parents can receive support in their languages? Is there a number they can call? What efforts have been made to recruit more bilingual staff to assist non-English speaking families with admissions process? Non-English speaking families, non-English speaking families can always work with our call center or our family welcome centers to get assistance to submitting their applications or learning about the process. Um, we also rely on school staff, as I said before, who know their children best to support them on the admissions processes. Our call center and, F and family welcome centers provide interpretation in over 100 languages. We also have bilingual staff at our family welcome centers as well. Um, and we do have um, the call center phone number and our family welcome center phone numbers on our website. So they are accessible, those numbers are accessible. One other very important resource, uh, resource uh, Chair Joseph, as you know well, is our parent coordinators, uh, who very often are bilingual, trilingual, and in such an important um, uh, channel of communication for uh, all of our parents, but particularly our, our parents for whom English may not be a, a first language, so we rely on them, we train them as well. Thank you. Um, I'd like to recognize Council Member Ressler. Thank you for joining us. Um, what option does parents or guardians who cannot read lack access to a computer or is not familiar with technology have to submit their student's application? How are these options made available and or communicated? Who can parents reach out to in schools if they have questions on these issues and who can they reach out if the contact is not available to provide the needed support? Uh, we understand that families come with very different experiences and access to information and technology. In addition to my schools, uh, families can apply via phone or in person at a family welcome center, as I said, and we work with, the ad with advocacy groups and schools to spread the word about our information sessions. Uh, we know that many of our families rely on their phones or it for internet access, so we worked on making our digital platforms completely mobile friendly. Our agency partners with CBO partners um, 
who are aware of the information about family welcome centers, and they tend to send families there um, should they have any enrollment needs. We publish an admissions guide that provides information on every process in multiple languages, and these guides have information about how to reach us. And families with children already enrolled in schools can also submit via their school counselors or other school staff. Um, I have a major concern regarding admissions is, and the impact of student diversity in our schools. As New York City is cited as having one of the most segregated school systems in the nation, research, research showed that diverse school provides benefits to all students, including academic, cognitive, social, emotional, civic, and economic benefits. It is because of such benefits that in recent years, DOE established a diversity plan as well as a diversity admissions program. How many schools are currently participating in the diversity, diversity and admissions program? How many were added for the admission cycle this year? Did DOE host any informational session regarding diversity and admissions this admission cycle for school leaders or interested schools? What effort, if any, is DOE making to promote and expand participation in diversity admissions program? And has DOE tracked any data on the impact of the diversity in admissions program on, diverse, on school diversity? So currently we have about 100 or so schools um, implementing a diversity in admissions program. Broken down, we have about 26 in 3K, 50 in pre-K, 57 in kindergarten, 52 in middle school, and 43 in high school. Um, we work with superintendents and school communities, principals, um, to hear if they want to implement this. Uh, we have the information on our website. We are routinely in touch with superintendents and principals over a whole host of things, so we remind them that when each admission cycle comes up, if you'd like to do a diversity in admissions, please talk with your school leadership team, please talk with your community, please talk with your superintendent and let us know. Um, those, again, come to us from school communities. It's driven by the school community. Um, we, the rest of your question, you were asking if we, tr if we track the, if we track if it. If you track any data on the impact, so now it's data. Yes, and each year we, pu we report publicly on the DOD diversity and admissions outcomes and all or nearly all of our schools reach their admissions targets each year. You did ask how many are new to the process this year. I don't have that information here today, but I can get back to you with that number. Dan, you wanted to say something? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the results of the diversity admissions program are very promising, and so we certainly, I know Chancellor Banks and I are uh, uh, interested in figuring out and working with you and, and the committee on, on how to uh, promote it, encourage it. You know, we don't want to um, do a blanket mandate or anything of that nature. We want to make sure that uh, communities are involved and that uh, people understand the value of it. But it is very promising. It's, it's a, for New York City, it's a fairly small sample. I think about 100 schools and programs uh, that have these, these goals. But it's a pretty big sample. And again, the results are quite encouraging, both from the, uh, as Sarah says, the, the fact that uh, for the most part, they hit their goals. Uh, they hit their diversity goals just being intentional about their admissions processes. And they're hitting these goals all over the city in different places and at different levels. And so we are definitely interested in figuring out how to uh, expand those practices um, as quickly as we can while making sure that uh, it, doesn't, it never becomes just kind of a compliance exercise or a box checking exercise. It's something that people really understand the power and the value of it. Absolutely, it has to be meaningful. Um, I'm gonna allow my council member, uh, council member Sanchez. So before we move on to um, questions from other committee members, just a reminder for all those committee members who are um, virtual, if you could please use the raise hand feature if you have any questions. Thank you. Oh, Council Member Ung. And thank you, and thank you for your testimony today. I actually have a few questions about the mission uh, changes. Um, does DOE have a plan and um, timeline for engaging the community on the feedback regarding emission changes? Moving forward? Yes, moving forward. <laughs> yes, so that we, 
that is our plan. We are working on a, on a plan with our family engagement arm. We want, that, we want that to be part of our process, a habit, if you will, of my office to continually engage when Chancellor Banks came on board. Um, this was his vision and we are, my office and I are realizing that vision and we'd like that to be a habit of part of our work. So yes. Great, so maybe we should just stay concretely to this year then. Is there a timeline for this year, for the upcoming um, you know, um, school year next year? Not yet, but okay. as soon as we have it, we'll share it with the council. Great, um, so again, in these um, engagements regarding the feedback, are the same groups that you mentioned here, the same groups you reach out to in this, I'm sorry, in this chart, are they the same? I'm just thinking about the yeah. plan, like it's the same groups, and it, you know, do you also listen for you know to the CECs? So yes, we listen to the CECs. Yes, it will be the same groups, and we would love to hear if there are other groups that we should be engaging as well. So this is not a finite list of of groups. Um, we we definitely can expand, and yes, we have um, relationships with our CECs, and we engage them as well. So I, I'm going to narrow this a little bit more. Um, is there a timeline this year? Um, you know, is it the next month, the next coming months? Let's give a preparation to everybody involved. I would say in the next couple of months, we will have a plan ironed out. Excellent, and I know this will require um, communications and feedback. Is there thoughts um, about um, using um, statewide tests, is there thoughts about um, using that as a part of the admissions process again? I think everything is on the table for discussion okay. and we'd like to hear multiple perspectives about what would make sense for families and communities. So I think that is definitely something that we would listen to, yes. Great, thank you. And I just have a quick question about GNT. Um, GNT has been very popular, the expansion of GNT. I'll say for my district, I'm not gonna say that for all the districts. Is there also plans and thoughts about expanding the GNT program? Yeah, yes, certainly, and that's, that's driven by demand. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, I think, uh, fairly soon release the figures of how many applications we got for kindergarten GNT this year. But it was substantial. It's, you know, many thousands of families looking for these spots. And so we have to look at that. And we have to look at it locally. Again, uh, I'm going to keep coming back to, but this is the, um, the emphasis we have on our structure. The superintendents, a big part of their job is putting their ears to the ground and understanding what the demand is. So I would, let me, let me say this, I, I would not be surprised if what comes up from the ground level is a demand for, for more uh, uh, gifted and talented seats in particular places, and um, you know, we'll certainly be responsive to that, absolutely. Great, and just one last question following up with the GNT. Uh, back to the admissions in GNT. Is there thoughts about, uh, again, what are the criterias to the admissions to the GNT program that would be a little different than this year? I mean, that's, that, that's again, something we're looking at very closely and listening. You know, there would, obviously there used to be a, a, uh, a test um, for, uh, for kindergarten GNT. Uh, right now we're doing an assessment uh, and that teachers are, are administering and, and not a test. There's some issues in the, in the research around using a test. Is that really an accurate measure for kindergarten admissions? Um, but this is something that people are looking at all over the country. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue to, um, to look at the data, look at the research, talk to people obviously on the ground. We wanna, we wanna provide access to those students who are interested, families who are interested and will benefit from accelerated learning. Uh, we want to accommodate every single one of those, those children. We have to figure out the, the best way to uh, make sure that a, that a child and a student is gonna be successful with accelerated learning. And so we'll keep, we'll keep those options on the table. Thank you, and then I look forward to, I'm sure, speaking with all of you in the future. Thank you, Council, council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Venikoff. Thank you, Chair Joseph. Um, how much public input from middle schools uh, was received after the September announcement, if you can comment on that. How oh. much, yeah. Oh, go ahead. How, I'm yeah. sorry, how much public input was received? On the middle school admission. Process. Middle school screens? Yes. Council member? Yes. 
I mean, uh, we, we didn't try to quantify it you know, collectively, but it was a lot. It was a big effort. Uh, it looked different in different districts. Uh, some superintendents, as I'm sure you know, did a number of town halls. Uh, some engaged heavily with CECs. Some went to PTA by PTA and, and got input that way. Um, so collectively, I think it was a massive amount of input. Could it have been more, of course. Uh, you can never, um, never have enough, never hear from enough people. But uh, in general, I think our superintendents did a really nice job of reaching out to the communities and, and getting input. Thank you. And uh, can you just comment a little bit about uh, what criteria do you, does the DOE use in screening for competitive middle schools and high schools? It does it use grades, attendance? Thank you. For both middle and high school, we use course grades, the four course grades, um, English, history, math, and science. So for middle school, we look at fourth grade core course grades, and for high school, we look at seventh grade core course grades. There are a couple of middle schools um, that use auditions um, for admissions. And if that use what, I'm sorry? Auditions for admissions. Auditions. Mm -hmm. So just grades and auditions? Grades and auditions. We have a we have a set of high schools that use, um, in addition to grades, they use a portfolio of assessments as well. It could be an essay submission or a video submission. Okay, thank you. And um, under the lottery-based admission system, let's say a student has a grade point average of ninety-seven. Um, could that student technically be, be left out of a seat? Is that accurate? That is accurate. Yes. And Just to clarify, I, 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 to make sure we're, we're being clear, for a particular school, yes. Is that uh, a student with a 97 average going to receive an offer? Absolutely, but it may not be to a particular school if it's a very high demand school. Understood, thank you. And um, can you comment a little bit about, um, you know, the, the DOE has a total budget of $38 billion uh, for the 22-23 school year. And the New York City provides just a little bit half of that. So considering how significant the contribution from uh, New York taxpayers is, is there some kind of an official representative body to hear the concerns and oversight from parents and taxpayers uh, regarding admissions and other matters? I wouldn't say, uh, council member, there's a body particularly focused on um, high school and middle school admissions, uh, but uh, you know, I'd, I, I would assert that that sort of responsiveness and accountability uh, runs from the mayor, uh, of course, who was held accountable by the, by the voters, uh, down through his appointees, Chancellor Banks, the superintendents uh, at, at the local level. Uh, the CECs, I think, do a, do a good job of asking those questions about budget and where the money is being spent. Um, probably we, we could get into a longer uh, explanation of the uh, process that already exists at the school level to approve budgets um, uh, and then at the district level as well. So there's, there's a fair amount of communication, not saying it couldn't be better, about where the money is spent and there are mechanisms for input from New Yorkers from, from all over the city on that, at different levels. Thank you. Can we get assurances from you that the state standardized test will be used by screen programs? I'm sorry, council member, I, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Can you, could, uh, could you just repeat that? Sure, can we get assurances from you that the state standardized tests will be used by screen programs? As uh, Sarah mentioned, um, that's, that is something that uh, is on the table that we're looking at. We, again, we want to make sure that uh, our admissions processes and our screening processes where they exist are fair. Uh, and so, uh, you know, tests used to be a part of the equation. It's possible that at some point they become part of the equation. We do think that the current um, screening system that, that um, identifies students who are excelling based on their, their grades is, is a good one. but. Um, you know, we certainly wouldn't take anything off the table. All right, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Dinowitz. Thank you, Chair. Um, Deputy Chancellor, I, I love what you said in the beginning about our kids, that brilliance is everywhere. Uh, and I 
I, I love that you said that because I, I believe that too. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've seen since I was in middle school where they started, you know, getting rid of honors programs and self-contained classes is there seems to be this sort of, I don't know, policy in the Department of Education that every child is the same. And, and we see it hurting our kids where, um, you know, I've taught schools that don't offer self-contained classes for students who need them, and we're not offering a wide variety of things like AP classes or even honors programs. Um, I, I would say part of this is the, is the breakup of our high school, but I have a, a, a few questions. I, is there any effort in the Department of Education um, to allow schools to provide more, I'm gonna put them in quotation marks, screens. And I'll give you an example. You know, one of the great promises of these small schools uh, and high schools that we were given was students can explore their, their interests. They can go to a school that really speaks to them. But what ends up happening, we, you know, there's a school of finance, there's a school of theater, there's a school of painting, there's a school of TV repair, whatever it is. And there's not even a question on the application of, do you like this? Is this something that interests you? And all of these theme schools become just another Department of Education school without speaking to that brilliance and the interests and the diversity that exists within, within our city. So is there any effort or ability for an individual school to say, you know, we, we just want to be able to know if a kid's interested in this without being, uh, so, so, so they are getting an experience that's beneficial to them and our teachers can actually create curriculum centered on the theme of the school. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Council Member, and, and uh, th these are great points. I'm probably not going to do it justice here, but uh, obviously we'll, we'll continue to, to work with you on these issues. On the issue of, of themed schools, I want to say, you know, some of them uh, do I exactly what you are um, laying out as, as the ideal. Uh, you know, an aviation high school does, I think, a pretty good job of making sure that the incoming students understand what the focus is, and they, they have a terrific, very deep uh, program where kids are, are learning at a, at a very high level. Um, you, you are also correct that uh, some of the schools uh, and some of the small high schools that were open on a, on a particular theme hasn't been as successful uh, and the kids sometimes are there and don't necessarily, um, two things, they don't necessarily have a deep interest in, in whatever the theme is and the theme may not be uh, really explored in a deep way. Uh, and so the, the, there's, not, there's not great alignment there. I would just maybe as a placeholder for further discussion, the, the pathway strategy that you've probably heard about, we've discussed, um, is in part uh, an improvement on that. And what I mean is think about, um, a, particularly for high schools, but this is also true ultimately for middle school, you go to uh, you know, a small school <clears throat> on the Mars campus in, in the Bronx, and you have an opportunity to engage. You may not know a ninth grade as a rising you know, ninth grader what it is you want to pursue uh, in high school, much less in your career, but you have choices uh, that are high quality choices for healthcare careers, for tech careers, for business careers, for education careers, and you, you, have, you can go deep in each of those at a particular school. That's more where we're heading. Uh, right, but I, so, I, so I want to pause. Yeah, I, you know, I want to pause there because I hear you. It's running out of time. Want to respect the time, um, but I, I would just say that I highly encourage you to look at your transfer protocols because it is near impossible for a high school kid to transfer schools from one to another if their interests change or their academics change. So you know, they do meet the criteria for making academic standards for another school. They can't transfer. I'm sure you know the easiest and best way to transfer schools when you're in high school. Do you know it? You know, it's, it's, it's get beat up. That is the easiest way to get a transfer. It's called a safety transfer. That is a, and I, think, I don't think that's a great policy for the DOE to have. And so when we talk about choice and, and, and options and the brilliance of our students, I think the DOE policy for allowing that flexibility should reflect that. And I do want to point out one thing about, I didn't, um, about GNT, and this is my last, uh, point is that I didn't really hear that there is a, uh, from Councilmember Ong's question, that there is a um, plan for how we're assessing young students, very young students for the GNC program. And I would, I would point out that 
I think a single exam for four-year-olds is obviously not the best approach, but the current approach of, of, of recommendations has not, in at least one citywide honors program, has not resulted in more diversity, but has simply resulted in the lowering of standards, and that's, and that's measurable, and I'm happy to talk to you in more detail about that after this hearing. Um, but, but we deserve you know, better, more, uh, better assessments for our students that really do reflect the, the population in which they should be learning with one another in, in the interests and ability of the population. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you Councilmember Council Dinowitz. Um, I'm calling on Councilmember Sanchez. And I'd also like to recognize um, Councilmember Krishna and Councilmember Janeiro. Thank you, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, we're we're lucky to have you, um, and thank you, member of the members of the administration, for testifying. So my question is going to focus on the important uh, the importance of Councilmember Joseph's Intro 338, which I am a proud co-sponsor of, which would establish a bullying prevention task force. Uh, according to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey from the CDC about New York City, between 2009 and 2019, bullying and e-bullying were two times more likely among LGB students than heterosexual students. 32% of LGBTQ plus uh, youth that were bullied in New York City schools reporting attempting suicide in the previous year. And that number is 40% for transgender youth. Black LGB participants were the only group for which suicidal ideation is actually increasing over time. And that's at an increasing rate. This is unacceptable. And so for all students, we know that bullying is unfortunately associated with suicidal ideation and attempt. And that is, you know, the, the one of the strongest reasons that I am supporting intro 338. And there are policies that the DOE could have in place and yet does not. For one, the DOE has only one LGBTQ liaison who's responsible for one million students and for reviewing complaint data across educators, administrators, and students. There's been turnover in this role. You're, as far as I understand, you're on the third liaison in just a handful of years because you have it as an impossible job. So one, we need to increase the number of folks who are working as LGBTQ liaisons. Our schools have very few gender sexuality alliances, one of the most proven school-based intervention. Three, there's no comprehensive health education that is inclusive of LGBTQ plus in the curriculum. Four, nearly 90% of teachers and administrators are not being trained on GS, uh, on gender sexuality diversity. And this is, this, is all, this is all just completely unacceptable. Out for Safe Schools, which is an intervention that is uh, practiced in, in several schools is an untested one. And so all of this to say that this, this task force is an important place for, for the Department of Education to give full access to the group of educators, uh, mental health professionals, and others who, who become a part of the task force. The DOE should be giving full access to rich information so that there can be, rec uh, there can be evaluations of policies and practices that can save student lives. So the question with all of that is, are you in support of Intro 338? And do you commit to a robust implementation and participation in the task force? Good afternoon, and thank you so much for that question. Um, my name is Kenyatta Reed. I'm executive director of the Office of Safety and Youth Development. Um, we are in full support of the spirit of the proposed legislation um, to prioritize the safety, the emotional, psychological, and physical safety of our children, to rally multiple agencies, and also, and especially, the inclusion of parent and ch children voice in this process. Um, I'd like to extend just my personal time and to offer an opportunity to, to meet with this committee to really share the work that we have been doing already and talk about ways in which this bill can support this work. We've had practices such as SEL instruction, restorative community building. Um, we have an online bullying portal. We have policies that have been updated for as far as respect for all and chancellor's regulation. We have existing local laws, as you know, 51 and 45 and 231, um, all of which that we report material incidents, we talk about our um, GSAs and the growth of that work and our supports for LGBTQ students. 
Um, I firmly believe a deeper conversation would allow us to co-create this approach um, that continues to prioritize our children. Just to quickly talk about some of the things, because I completely agree as far as number one, um, the workload of our LGBTQ uh, manager. I am very pleased that we did hire an LGBTQ coordinator, so now we have double the size from one to two. Um, you talked about our GSAs. We um, are very proud that we are having our first in-person GSA summit since um, lockdown. That is actually coming off on Monday. We have over 1,500 young people on their day off, because that is not a high school instructional day that we'll be attending. So that's gonna be um, Monday coming up. We have a full day of events for them. Um, we're also expanding the number of GSAs that we are supporting. Uh, we are using some restorative justice money to expand that number from 180 to now well over 300 GSAs, because I'm in complete agreement with the power of GSAs as an affinity group for our young people. Um, so those are just a few of the things to touch on the, the questions that you have, but I, I really, really just want to um, offer an opportunity to sit down with the committee to not only share some of the details, but also co-create uh, a really robust plan so we can support our children. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. May, may I have just one more minute? One more. Got one more. Um, good to hear about the, the GSA summit. Please let us know when and where. Only 29% of schools have a GSA right now, so good to hear about your expansion efforts, going to be monitoring that. And then just a follow-up question, uh, doesn't have to be answered now, but for the Chief Enrollment Officer, you said that approximately 60 schools down from 159 uh, have still opted to screen students. Um, I would I would love for this council to have that information uh, because I'm almost willing to bet that the, the schools that or the districts that continue need to screen are the ones who are probably associated with ex historic exclusionary practices. So would love to, to have that information so that we can continue this conversation about fairness and integration. Thank we you, Chair. Yeah, we can provide with you with that information. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so does the DOE fully support the idea of a bullying prevention task force? If not, why? Yes, as stated, we, we definitely support the entire spirit of this legislation and want to meet with you more and talk about the work that we're doing. I want to discuss the gaps within that work, as, as mentioned by your colleague, and then really make sure that we are not replicating anything. We are not um, replicating things as reports and local laws, and then this way we can put together a comprehensive partnership to ensure that we support every child. Um, this so, council yes. funded, thank you, this council funded um, an LGBTQ curriculum, half a million dollars. How is that looking and how's it going and how's that rollout look? So that rollout was going extremely well. Um, last year we, through this partnership, invested in over $800,000 of li digital libraries for all of our schools to have access to. We're continuing that work with our Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, Predominantly, our, my office, um, with our LGBT coordinator and manager, we review the text and then give those offerings to teaching and learning, and that's the way in which that partnership works. And as Councilmember Sanchez mentioned, that, staff, that office has two people for almost a million students. How does that work? That's a lot of work on two people. Maybe Great. you need to staff up in that office. We, we do agree with that. Um, we also have student service managers that work in every superintendent office. Um, they are our direct access to schools um, as far as support, but the team is brilliant, I, I must say. We have a brilliant team. Um, Kalima and Jude are amazing. Thank you. Council Member Lee, you're up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I guess I'll, I have questions for different levels of the schools, and so I just wanted to, um, I guess, start with the lower grade levels with the GNT, because I remember, I think I'd asked this in a previous um, hearing, but for GNT, I remember I'd asked folks, um, you know, what is the additional cost, right, for adding GNT programs? And I hear what you're saying, um, First Deputy Chancellor, <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, the demand, but I, I guess my question is, why are we waiting for the demand? Because I, I actually firmly believe that all schools, 
um, you know, have talented students, call it something else, call it something else other than GNT. But I, I think that each school has a lot of talented students. And I guess my question is, why are we not meeting their levels? And, and then my other question related to GNT is, has there been any efforts to reevaluate? Because I understand what some of the other sentiments are. Um, I don't mind being transparent about this. My four-year-old, he's now eight. When he was four, he didn't get in. I didn't realize that there were like prep courses for some of these GNT classes, right? But also at the same time, I think we have to look at the person as a person and not every student is going to test in at age four and not every student is going to remain at that level to stay in it for all those years in elementary school. So I guess my question is, you know, how are you looking at the reevaluation of those students? And I, I feel like what's happening is that, and I, I agree with what um, Council Member Dinowitz was saying, I feel like we should all be moving, trying to traject, move people's trajectory upward, but I think what's happening at least from what I've seen from the last administration as well, is that there's almost like this, like like we're pushing people towards the middle versus striving people upwards, and I'm not understanding why. Yeah. That was my first question, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the, I, I don't have the, uh, council member, thank you for, for, for that. I, I don't have the uh, cost numbers, but certainly we can get that to you. You know, there, there is, if you are going to do a any sort of accelerated program, as you say, whether you call it G and T or something else, um, if it's going to be meaningful, and not just a sorting mechanism, which is not w what probably any of us are, are interested in, then it requires uh, curriculum, uh, it requires uh, teacher development work and principal development work. Um, we are doing that, and so part of um, I, I I hear your frustration. I'm sure you hear from. Um, some of the folks in your community saying, gosh, why aren't there more spots right away? In part because we want to make sure that we're not just opening something up and putting a label on it and, and uh, misleading parents, frankly, about what their child is going to get in the school. We want to make sure people are trained, there's curriculum, there's support, there's expertise at different levels. Uh, and so I think we made a pretty good down payment on that demand uh, and we're going to continue to look at, look at that as, as we go forward, but we're going to make sure it's meaningful. Uh, that's that's really really important um, so and then your point is a I think an excellent one on you know students at different age groups um, uh, have different needs and you know that it, it may be that you have a student who really uh, is going to benefit uh, uh, from an accelerated program in elementary school but not so much in middle school uh, and or, or in high school they may be going in a different direction and 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 um, you know, accelerated academics may not be the right program for them. So, mm -hmm. so we have to do more. I will say that's a that's a underdeveloped area for us, but something we're really interested in, to allow those on ramps and off ramps um, right. uh, during the course of a of a child's career. Right. Okay. And then, just in terms of, I, I was wondering if I could get clarification when it comes to the middle school screening admissions policies, because in your testimony, I know you're saying, um, and I'll just read it as a result of their thoughtful engagement. Um, you know, each district has tailored admissions processes that has brought the overall s number of schools with the academic screens down to 59 from 196 prior to the pandemic. This robust process ensured that decisions about middle school screens reflected local needs and were communicated to families in advance. Um, so I guess my question is, is that um, I, I, I don't know what, I'm just, I'll, I'll just be upfront. Like, I feel like this word screening sort of has like a dirty connotation or negative connotation. So I guess my question is though, I just want a clarification because it may not be screenings in the traditional sense, but each school, which I agree, like I, I think it should be tailored because no school or community or council district is gonna be the same, right? And so I guess my question is, is that even though there technically weren't screenings, each school came up with their own set of criteria, is that correct? in terms of how they were gonna accept students? I mean, there must have been some, some criteria, no? So if, if, if after engagement, uh, the, the district and the superintendent decided that some of the middle schools were going to be screened, the screening is universal across middle schools with the exception of the audition schools. We have some audition middle schools, so it's using the core course grades. Right, um, so if they weren't the using other the other schools are open admissions, just right. a pure so, lottery. Okay, so if they're not using the screening, they're using some other way of figuring it out, right? 
they're just it's a it's an open lottery for the rest of the for the other schools there's no there's no other way to get in so you either have a screened school in your schools in your district and some are unscreened okay and then it's a lottery okay um i have more questions after your answer but i'll, I'll, I'll hold for a second but is it okay if i have, have one more question we're really tight this okay. last question we're really tight on um time. Because I understand that um, for the purposes of the high schools, for example, um, the removal of the geographic zonings and the lack of seats in Queens, I guess I'm talking more about Queens in particular, because I had a lot of constituents in our districts that, that literally, and these are not specialized schools, by the way, that I'm talking about, is that they put 12 schools on their list and they were not accepted into any of the schools in their area. And I'm talking about a pretty large geographic area. So, so my question is, is um, I understand that we want to, because I worked in the AAPI community for many, many years, and I think, you know, we see lots of, you know, um, conversations, and I'm all for, because we need to be more diverse, I understand that, but I guess my question, though, is, um, I think there also needs to be a balance, right, because if, we're, if parents have to send their schools all the way to Manhattan, or halfway across the city, I don't think that's necessarily doing a service for the students as well. If they're spending more than the, and I'm coming from a transit desert, so it takes at least an hour to get anywhere, even within Queens. So, so I guess my question is, how how are we helping to number one um, address that issue about the geographic locations, but then also what are we doing to create, you know, um, just I think the focus should be in general. How do we improve? schools overall so that the under-resourced schools get the resources that they need so that every single student in the city actually has what they need to succeed, right? I think that's the focus. It's like, no matter where you are, like that, that should be the focus is how do we get our students the best education possible, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know the chair says we're tight on time, so I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, but uh, couldn't agree more. Like the ultimate vision the chancellor talks about is really a neighborhood school strategy, meaning not that there aren't choices, maybe uh, your child will decide or you will decide the child will travel because they're looking for something very specific, but you should be able to go to the school that's down the block, the school that's in your neighborhood that's maybe only a couple of subway stops or a couple of bus stops away, and know that your child's going to get a good solid education. Right now, a lot of our parents aren't feeling that, and hence, I sometimes think that the, the metric you ought to hold us account accountable for, I'm being half serious here, is the, 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 the commute time for our kids. If the commute time is going down, that probably means our schools are getting better. If the commute time is going up and our kids are an hour and a half on the bus or the train, that probably means that something is wrong. So agree with your sentiments 100%. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Hanif. Thank you so much. I'd like to take a moment to just applaud the work of uh, the D15 diversity plan. School District 15 overlaps heavily with my district, Council District 39 including Park Slope, Carroll Gardens, Cabo Hill, and other neighborhoods. Um, and the work that D15 has done to successfully racially integrate middle schools, while there's still more work to do and improvements to be made, can really serve as a model citywide um, for how we can develop and implement a community-led approach to dismantling our segregated school system. And removing academic screens in the admissions process has been critical like absolutely critical to this work in D15, and I want to state my support publicly um, that moving away from screens in the Dewey, DOE all the way from differentiating between gifted and non-gifted preschoolers to the SHSAT, which has severely limited diversity at our specialized high schools. So in the aim of understanding how this administration is affirmatively furthering and advancing racial integration, I'd like to ask some questions. So local law 225 of 2018 states that every school district that does not have a diversity plan must have a formed diversity working group uh, working toward recommendations by 2024. What has been the DOE's progress so far in fulfilling its obligations under this law? And how many districts have established uh, district diversity working groups? Thank you, Council Member. Appreciate your sentiments on that and appreciate the, the plug for District uh, 15 with, uh, and, and the middle school plan there. Um, <clears throat> um, so we, uh, we're, we're going to get that information to you. I know that a lot of the work that was being done in furtherance of the law 
was interrupted by the uh, pandemic because it made uh, outreach very difficult. Uh, so we're, we're going to we're reengaging right now to figure out where each district is in that process, and we're obviously going to support them to make sure that we are uh, fully in compliance. Um, the to your larger question uh, uh, or your 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 question, which I think is a good one for all of us, you know, how can District 15 and the middle school process serve as a model? I, you know, again, would love to hear your thoughts and the thoughts of your colleagues about that. That is very much, I, I think, an example of a community-driven process uh, where there's a lot of input and a lot of engagement with some outside facilitators who I believe were, were quite helpful. Um, we would very much like to have other districts and other communities engage in, in that sort of process. Some of them are. Sure. Um, but uh, what's the way to, to have that happen in an organic way, not, uh, not a top-down way? Absolutely, but it, it would require the DOE to have some infrastructure, for sure, and not just entirely leave it up to the communities. So um, just to be clear, the District Diversity Working Group initiative was paused during the pandemic. Yes, I, it was interrupted during the pandemic, yes. I, I, I don't want to say for sure, that there wasn't work that continued in some districts. This is something that we're checking on right now, but in general, it, it, it definitely interrupted the work. And who would be checking or who should we be in touch with about that? We will absolutely figure out who the right point person is. We've got right now multiple people lo looking at that. Got it. It's, it is a little disappointing to know that there's no clarity on sort of if it was actually interrupted and what's going on, so I really look forward to learning more about this. The School Diversity Advisory Group put forward over 60 adopted recommendations uh, present on the DOE's website, meant to be guiding principles for creating an inclusive and equitable system, several of which are specific to enrollment. How is the DOE continuing to track their progress on the adopted recommendations, and can updates be made available to the school and the public? We are tracking progress. Um, we are doing that through our, through our feedback sessions, through our changes to our admissions to make things easier for families and as application processes end. We, we track and look at the application numbers. Um, we look to see where we can make adjustments and of course we rely heavily on our superintendents to um, help with their communities and sort of have the, have the kind of outreach and community engagement um, to see where we can make more progress. And then has the School Diversity Advisory Group been meeting quarterly and publishing annual reports as required by Local Lot 224 of 2019? I have to get back to you on that. And are you the point person for the, this information? There are a few of us who are the point people, so we will make sure that we get, get back to you on all of that information about the School Diversity Advisory Group. And then the timely release of the annual school diversity accountability report pursuant to Local Law 59 of 2015 is important to continuing to understand school demographic trends as well as the DOE's progress in encouraging diversity in New York City public schools. When can we expect this, this year's report to come out? The law requires the most updated report to be released by November 1st, 2022. It was submitted and we're posting today. Wonderful, great timing, thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Narcisse. Good afternoon. Um, what I see is every child, every child is gifted and talented. If we give them the structure, we give the support. And before I start, I'm gonna tell you, I'm a mother of four, all my kids benefited from gifted and talented program in specialized high school. But having said that, I want my district to be gifted and talented. And I see if I'm listening to all my colleagues, that's what we're getting at, to say all children should have the same opportunity. And my thing is, what are you doing in terms of helping, especially when it comes to tests, to, to prep, it's a lot of money. So what is the gradu graduation rate and the college acceptance rate for uh, gifted and talented schools, high schools? And uh, how many ESL students are currently enrolled in gifted and talented program? And what are the chances for a three-year-old, non-speaking, non-English speaking, get to this country, be accepted in a specialized high school? I'm going to... Stop on there. Maybe you can answer some before I continue. 
Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Narcisse, and those are, those are great questions. I don't, I don't have the answer here, but those are, those are questions we can and will answer, uh, give you specific uh, answers. I, don't, I will say on the last one, I'm not sure we, we can do that analysis. I think it's a great question. I would love to research that. If you're a three-year-old coming to this country, not speaking English, what are your chances to get into a specialized high school or screen high school? We can certainly give you the demographics of those specialized high schools. But I would love to dig into that and, and, and get as close as we can to answering all of your questions very specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I answer any of those? No. I, I don't. I don't have that data here, and I don't. I, I don't want to uh, uh, give you anything that's at all inaccurate. Okay. But so now, if I say, excuse what me, are, council member, you will follow up with that data for our committee members, correct? Yes, chair. Absolutely. We're Thank we're, you. we're taking all these down. I'm looking at, at staff, and we will absolutely give you written uh, answers and then obviously we're always happy council member Narcisse to jump on the phone okay and, follow -ups. and what are you doing DOE, DOE is doing to change the narrative that specialized high school or gifted high school are the only one that can give you a chance to better your life in New York City while well, we're talking about New York City Oh, gosh, that is such a great question. I don't know, uh, Councilmember Narcisse, if you were able to be there or, or see the uh, announcement the chancellor did about the uh, high school, screen high schools, because I think, I think Chair Joseph was there. He had with him, when he made the announcement, about 20 principals of screen schools that are not the ones that we all hear about all the time that are wonderful schools, that are schools serving mostly black and uh, Latino, Latina uh, students that don't get a lot of press, they don't get a lot of attention, but these are thriving, wonderful schools. And so that's just an example of something the chancellor is personally committed to. He didn't just stand up there at the lectern and you know, say, this is my thing. He's like, have each of these principals talk about their schools because we have schools that should be in higher demand, but we're not doing a good job of getting the word out for them. So this is, this is a whole body of work that we would love to talk to you about. And I'm with Council Member Lee as well about traveling because one of my son had ended up in Bronx Science and coming from Canarsie in the transportation desert. So if I had good school in my community, I don't think I would make my children. They've been traveling since they were five because I'm looking. And all parents, every parent's dream is to have their kids to have the best quality education. And I think we have that responsibility toward New York City and the budget, we're talking about billion, 30 billion of dollars. So we can do better for New York City, and I think we have to spend our money wisely to educate and to have a better future for tomorrow. The inequities that we're seeing, the children that are having the gun in New York City happen to have not having enough structure. Because I can tell you, I'm a mom of four, and I have been through it. I'm not speaking from just out there in contrast. I'm talking about my history from a person coming from Haiti as a high school, and I could not get in a specialized high school, but my children, I make sure I work for it. So let's do better for New York City and address the inequities, especially starting with education. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Member Council Member Narcisse. I just have a quick follow up. Council Member Avi, let's just give me two seconds. Um, according to the DOE, 40% um, of our students with disabilities fall into group five and screen high school programs, and only three to five percent fall into group one. So what percentage of students with disabilities receive first priority to screen high school programs in 2022 and 2023? And what, the, what, what is DOE doing to ensure that students with disabilities are not underrepresented at screened high schools? So at all of our high schools, um, there, are special there are students with disability seats reserved um, based on the borough average. And um, the, way that the, the way that admissions works is that even if there's, for example, as you said, even if there's a smaller percentage of students with disabilities who are in group one, the minute that, group, the, the minute that those students who are in group one are placed, we immediately go to group two. Then once those students are placed, we immediately go to group three. Students with disabilities are in their own bucket competing against other students with disabilities. They are not competing for general education seats. They are competing for students with disability seats in every single one of our schools, screened or not screened. So what does that, the numbers look like in, the bor in each of the boroughs? 
I can get back to you with that information for sure and share it with you. That would be very helpful. Thank I you. Will. Council yeah. Member Aviles. Gracias. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, I continue to be um, deeply dismayed at the use and the return to practices that perpetuate segregation in New York City public schools and the disparities that are clearly pointed out in all of the data. Now, I understand there are exceptions to the rules, but it's important to note that the screens have a negative connotation because of the historical realities and the purpose of these screens was to discriminate. And it did achieve that. And we see continuing use and perpetuation of that situation by clear outcomes. There are still very much of disparities across the board. I, I, I'm sorry I missed your presentation, but I, was, I had a curiosity around the middle school admissions where it noted a significant decrease from 196 to 59. Is that simply academic screens or does the 196 include all kinds of screens? Simply academic screens. Simply academic screens. Great, and do we know the total number of schools that use additional other types of screens like auditions and? So at the high school level, it, um, I think it, uh, let me just make sure that I have the information to give you the right information. Okay, so um, for the middle school, we have 40, 40 schools who do an audition. Um, 40, I'm sorry, 40 programs that do an audition. Um, we have 40 programs um, that have a language criteria. We have 52 screened programs. Um, and um, we have 21 that do a talent test. So the 52 screened are different from the 59 screened in the presentation. Those mean different things. Um, so the 52, the 52 screened programs are within the 59 schools, so, so yes. Got it, got it. Well, I will continue to, I think I come from District 15 and have a little sliver of District 20. They have very different views on this yes. issue. Um, District 15 most certainly is not in favor of ongoing screens um, and their impacts. But I just wanna say in terms of G&T, we've had one class room that was put into a local school in my district. It has 11 children in their class. Every other class in that grade level has 28 children. Can you explain to me how this is supposed to work for children given overcrowding in classrooms and our clear knowledge that classroom size matters for everyone, for students, for educators, how do we explain this to parents? So um, the gifted and talented process um, is filled based on demand and based on um, how you if, you, if you are screened in. And if there is a classroom that has that, that few students, 11, it is based on the demand in terms of so the number of students. So how do I explain to the parent in the 28 uh, with the 28 students, that their child can't get access to a small classroom size? I mean, so if that's the case, then the, the principal presumably is gonna make changes for, for next year. If the demand isn't there, we're not gonna maintain classrooms uh, where, where there isn't sufficient demand. Uh, and those sorts of, by the way, I would say that that's a, um, a uh, variable class size is something that you see more times than not in schools for various reasons. Okay, so in terms of, is the DOE um, considering any changes to enrollment planning in order to make it easier for all schools to comply with the new class size law? So we, um, we certainly will be in compliance with the class size law as written. <clears throat> we are, uh, have planning groups internally that uh, meet on a regular basis, uh, really on a weekly basis, to make sure that uh, we have a good plan for compliance. We're uh, meeting with our labor partners as the, as the law lays out. Um, 
So we will be in compliance as the as you know there's a five year phase in and, and we're planning for that for that phase in. Um, at this point, uh, we're not planning changes to admissions policies in order in order to comply. But there will there will need to be some significant trade offs and changes made as uh, as we phase in that law. Is has the DOE taken any actual steps? We hear in response to this, we will, we will, we will, we will. That time will go very quickly. We want to know what is being put into place right now. What actions are concretely being taken right now? <clears throat> right now, we're making sure that we that we are uh, in compliance with the first phase of the law. And, and we will be. With the, the, the future tense uh, that I'm using is not because we think we're not in compliance, it's just because of the timing of the law. And so we're looking at year one, year two, year three, et cetera, and year one is next year essentially, and we will be in compliance in year one. Great, I'd love to hear more specifically and concretely with a timeline on exactly what DOE is doing to take concrete steps to abide by the law. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We'd be happy to meet with you on that. Thank you, Council Member. I'd like to recognize Council Member Stevens. And Council Member Ressler, you're next. Thank you so much, Chair Joseph. Greatly appreciate your leadership and, and convening of this hearing. Uh, First Deputy Chancellor, I believe your constituents, so I'll try to be nice. Um, not too nice, but a little nicer than I might otherwise be. Uh, <clears throat> I just do want to state plainly a comment at the front end that it's important for us to acknowledge that the Department of Education has never desegregated our schools. It never happened. And so every policy decision we make has to contribute to deepening integration and equity in our schools. Elimination of screens, elimination of GNT programs. These should be our North Stars so that we can ensure that we have integrated classrooms in every community and a far more equitable system than we tragically do not have today and have never had. That is not a failure on your all's part. Um, but that we're not doing enough, not nearly enough, after many, many decades of protracted segregation. Uh, I, I'm going to focus my questions, though, today on the 3K program, as I am profoundly disturbed by this administration's uh, commitment to take $1 billion away from 3K over the next three years. We were on a path to achieving universal 3K in the city of New York, and that appears to be something that this mayor is, you know, it's clear that this mayor is strongly opposed to, to that goal. Uh, so firstly, I had my uh, Instagram posts ready uh, for 3K applications, but I don't believe they've gone live yet. What's going on? When are 3K applications going live? Today. Okay. Application open today for 3K and for pre-K. So, I, I mean, I don't know, my staff told me they're not live. So it's happening in hours? There's a glitch? Is there a problem? No, it's open. It's open? Yes. Okay. The links are working as of now. Okay, we'll check. Thank you. Um, maybe we're just delayed. Uh, I believe that we are experiencing a, a neglect uh, of the 3K program by discontinuing meaningful outreach. And as with any government program, we need to be engaging diverse communities in multiple languages to help them enroll, uh, to help families enroll. Um, how many people are currently working on 3K outreach? So just to, uh, Sarah can give you the, the details on this. Thank you, council member. Uh, good to see you, as always. Um, uh, Let me know if there are any issues in the district. <laughs> I, I, I potholes or otherwise. <laughs> I certainly will. Uh, if not, my wife will. I'm okay, sure. good. Um, um, the so we we've heard the you know the comment or the questions about outreach and 3K. Uh, there's been really no diminution whatsoever in, in outreach. We're we're uh, continuing to do very vigorous Just outreach. Just to interrupt you on that yeah. one, my understanding is that outreach declined dramatically during COVID during the latter part of the De Blasio administration, and it's never come back and that no investment has been made, and we had a robust, dynamic, really effective, multilingual outreach team that was creative organizers in the de Blasio administration, and now it's gone. It's just totally gone, and nothing is happening. And that is why you all are taking a billion dollars away from 3K over the next three years. So um, 
applications for 3K went up significantly, and I think that's a testament to the outreach. Are you going to guarantee that every applicant for Universal 3K has a seat next year? No, because we have a misallocation of seats all over the city where we have a huge, a huge uh, surplus in seats in some places and a deficit in seats in others, which was a serious design flaw in the program. So we're having to deal with the aftermath. Of, Will you provide uh, a comprehensive breakdown to this committee of what seats are available, extended day, partial day, uh, by, by school district? Uh, happy to do that. Council. We have not received that information to date, so we will eagerly anticipate reviewing it. My understanding is we have extended day seats, which are like the gold standard that every family is dying to get into, vacant all across the city, um, because we are not doing outreach. So I really want to come back to the question of what is the size of the 3K outreach team, and can you elaborate on your 3K outreach plan? Just to be clear. There were thousands, tens of thousands of empty seats in this program before the pandemic, and there continue to be. But Sarah, why don't, why don't you address the specific question? So the 3K outreach team is part of the Office of Student Enrollment. My entire office does 3K outreach among outreach for other, all the other processes. Um, we, can I continue? Um, we, we, the, the number is, I mean, we have, hundreds of people who work in the Office of Student Enrollment across the city. Um, and we all do 3K outreach. We send, we send emails. We work with the community-based organizations. Uh, I, I, I would, how about this? I'll try and frame it more nicely. I'm very concerned that the dynamic early childhood education outreach efforts of the previous administration have been totally discontinued and are not happening in our communities, which are contributing to the available seats that families desperately need. So that is my hypothesis. What I want to offer, and I imagine that many of my colleagues around the table, and some are much more dynamic than me, um, many, maybe all of them, the, that we would like to be partners. So bring us in, and if you're all saying that we have empty seats that aren't being filled, I can tell you that every member of the city council would love to connect our families to early childhood education. So would somebody from your team be willing to go through with me a District 33, Districts 13, 14, and 15 outreach plan for 3K, and I'll put time, energy, and resources personally in to making sure that we fill every one of those seats and then some, because the demand is there. I talk to families every day in my community who are saying they can't get into 3K. So, there is a serious disconnect, and I don't. And I'd like to better understand what dedicated staff are, are actually working on this. Not everybody in your office, because that's not a that's not tangible. That's not specific. Council member, um, I'm, I'll shut up. Thank you, Chair Joseph. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, Council member Krishna. Thank you so much, Chair Joseph. Council member Russell, no one is as dynamic as you are. Just to state for the record. <laughs> um, you know, I, just, I did actually want to echo first, and thank you for your testimony today, um, and thank you, Chair, for this very important hearing. Uh, I think Councilmember Ressler's point, I do want to echo, it's a concern shared by many of us throughout the Council um, in terms of this administration's retreat from uh, 3K, which is a fundamental, I mean, we all know it's a foundational program, the data is very clear how crucial it is, um, and the notion of scaling back seats because of the lack of demand, uh, it just it can't be accurate, right? There's so many students in need of 3K. The real focus seems to be on the need for more multilingual, um, aggressive outreach, but to scale back a signature program raises major concerns for us. So I know I've made this clear at every education hearing we've had. I'll continue to do so, but I didn't want to flag that point again. Uh, there are a couple questions I have in particular. Um, one is uh, around uh, following up on, on Council Member Aviles's questions uh, about uh, the class size matter law, um, I still like to get a better sense of what DOE's intentions specifically are uh, to, to implement this, this mandate that we have now. Um, I think it was um, uh, earlier on November 10th um, at a CPAC meeting, uh, um, Ms. Kleinhandler, you were there and you spoke about the need to uh, consider the class size goals in the new state law, but I think at the time your response was more about you'll make sure that, it, that the law is adhered to if and when it actually comes down. 
Um, now we have, we have that law. It's the law of the, um, of the state. Um, but many of our schools continue to be very overcrowded and will obviously find it difficult to meet these new class size caps. But the concern is, is DOE aware and uh, committed to the class size mandate, the legal mandate at this point? Um, and what is the intention to comply with it? Um, what is the plan to tailor enrollment policies to better enable schools to meet those new caps? I know there's some sort of you know, um, general sense that now this is the law, but I would like to hear more specifically what are the steps that you all intend to take? Th thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Council Member Krishnan. Uh, good to see you. You um, too. Uh, so the, 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 first of all, I guess let me start here before we get into the, the really important details of, of uh, implementation of, of this law. Um, you know, the, the chance of the mayor, me, for whatever it's worth, uh, certainly would like to see lower class size. It's a, it's a win for everybody if, if we can't have lower class size. It obviously comes with costs and operational challenges. Uh, there's a few things you can do to lower class size. You can hire more teachers and open more classrooms, and that will happen uh, in the schools where there's space. Um, you can build more classrooms where you don't have that additional space. That also is called for, as you know, in the, in the law on the, on the capital side. You could also, theoretically at least, uh, limit uh, the, the incoming classes, uh, which um, you know, certainly as a, as a cost, maybe an intangible, but an important cost as well. If you have uh, more families trying to get into a particular place, who, who, a particular school who can't do it. Um, so certainly on the hiring of teachers, opening more classrooms, that, that's going to happen. That's part of, the, part of what we are planning for, just to give you more of a sense, because I, I get it that I'm not being sure. uh, particularly clear. Um, we're looking through the data, uh, almost classroom by classroom, school by school. Where are the places, where are the classrooms that already meet the caps? Because we do have many classrooms that already meet the caps. Uh, where are the ones that don't meet the caps? Uh, and there is space to open additional classrooms. Okay, so then the plan would be we're going to have to hire more teachers in that particular building and open additional classrooms. How many? What is the cost? What is the time uh, that will have to be invested in, in hiring potentially thousands of, of additional teachers? What are, the, what are the schools that aren't meeting the caps, or at least not in every grade and, and subject, um, where they're overcrowded and there isn't, there isn't additional space? Well, that becomes a, a capital issue so that's the sort of planning that we're doing. And again, looking at the full five-year phase in, what do we have to do to be in compliance year one, year two, year three? And you know, no mystery that it, it gets uh, much more difficult and is gonna require some potentially very painful trade-offs as we get to you know, year two, year three, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the, for the response. And, and Mr. Weisberg, just to, to conclude, is it your testimony then um, on behalf of the DOE today that this administration is aware of the class size mandate and fully intends to comply with that mandate? Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, and just a follow up, it's a two questions here, if, that, if that's okay. Very brief, I promise. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what, uh, what is just, um, you know, I think you, you touched on this a bit already, but you know, the DOE data is pretty clear. There are about 347,000 students that are crammed into to overcrowded schools, um, while many other schools are underutilized. Uh, can you speak a bit more to, to the plan to specifically address that fact? It's a pretty sizable amount of students in, in overcrowded schools. Yes, and uh, Sarah may want to jump in, or Nadia may want to jump in here as well from the, from the uh, admission side. Um, you know, part, part of that, again, is capital, and we do have new, we're, it's good that we have new schools coming online in Queens and, and other places, you know, new high schools, and so that, that will alleviate some of that uh, crowding. Um, the other thing that I know superintendents are very focused on right now is very often in districts or in, you know, high school, including high school districts, you have both. You have schools that uh, are overutilized, but you also have schools in the same geographic area underutilized. And so part of the answer is, I think Councilmember Narcisse was talking about this, make sure that A, those are really good schools. The ones that are underutilized are providing great programming for kids. And then we gotta make sure families and kids know about that. And so that's part of the answer is to equalize, is not to throw kids willy-nilly into other schools, but to attract them to other schools and programming 
And that is something that superintendents, with, with the help of our office, are really, really engaged in very deeply right, right now. Uh, new pro so expect to see as this year and particularly next year, new programming um, that is responsive to what the community is asking for in schools that are underutilized uh, so that, um, again, we, we attract more students to that and at the same time alleviate overcrowding in some other schools. And my final question, it's because of time, final, final question, is the, uh, the educational option admissions model was developed many years ago to create high schools that serve students of all academic performance levels. How many ed op programs are there currently and why hasn't this model been used more frequently in, use in recent years? I just need one second. Sure. Um, to date, we have 398 EDOP programs across the city. Um, EDOP priorities, prioritizes diverse learners from, random, from a random selection, so it's about a third of seats to pri are prioritized for high performers, a third for mid performers, and a third for lower performers. Um, we ask schools every year if they'd like to change their admissions, if they, and we, we always offer at op as one of them and so again that's something that's community driven with the principal and the superintendent um, we certainly can do better outreach and more outreach about um, about at op um, but it is always an option for a school thank you you're welcome thank you council member Stephen. hello um so just a couple of things i just want to start off by saying like one of my big angst has always been that it's a lot of emphasis put on specialized schools and gifted and talented programs, but we have a plethora of schools that is doing amazing work, and we need to get to a place where young people are being matched for their skills and what they need and, and what they, their support should be to the schools, because right now that just does not happen, um, because just because someone goes to a specialized school does not guarantee that that's a good match for them, right? But that is the narrative that is constantly being put out there, because I know a lot of young people who went to specialized high schools and went to screen schools, and they struggled in those places because they didn't have the supports or tools that they needed. Um, I even give the example of my daughter. She went to CPE2 at elementary school, an amazing school, and she's very art see and all the things and it was great for her my nephew went there for a week and was like uh i don't want to be here this is crazy like they in here doing art projects like they're calling teachers by the first name i need structure and discipline but it's a prime example of how you could have two students who clearly are good and academically but just need a different environments so my question to you is how do we start moving in that direction because that's not the direction we're in right now and that's not even any of the things that we ever really talk about how do we get to a place where we're looking at admissions that are matching young people with schools that they need with services instead of saying like, this is a specialized school, so I'm gonna go there. But because we have set this dynamic up, we need to really start working on really unraveling that. Because there's a lot of public schools who are doing amazing work, but just not necessarily a specialized school. So how do we get there and start kind of like dis dismembering this, this beast that we've all created? It's, uh, and, and Sarah, I'm sure we'll have more to say about this. Uh, Agree a hundred percent, Council Member. Thank you for those remarks. I mean, that's where we want to get to. That's Chancellor Banks' vision. Is yeah, one size does not fit all, and all kids are brilliant and capable of excelling, but not in the same areas at the same times in the same environments. And so, how do we find those environments? Um, I'm just gonna. So, so this is where we want to go, and we're going to need your help to figure out what's the right system in this huge, diverse city to get there, where we're almost personalizing our attention. So, for high school. The answer ultimately, I believe, is we, we have to pr provide really good guidance and support to students and families at every level. So we have some wonderful guidance counselors, we have some wonderful parent coordinators who are doing great work, 
but every child is not getting that sit down to say, well, if your child but is really interested in the arts, But I think if we're starting arts, in high school, that's here. part of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how are we working with elementary school parents, right? Because what happens now is you go to where you where you live, so that's the school you go to. But that doesn't mean that's a good fit. And so if we're starting with high school, we're, we're, already, we're already lost. So we need to get to a place where we're starting elementary of like, how are parents choosing schools? What are the options? What are those providers? Like that, like we can't just say, oh, we have guidance counselors in high schools. Like, what are we talking about? We have elementary and middle school where there should be options, and that is not the case now. Like, parents can't be like, my kid is not thriving in this school, so I think this is a better fit, so I'm gonna go over here. Those things don't happen because of the systems that we have set up. So I would love to hear and, and have us start thinking about how do we move in that direction, starting with elementary school, starting with pre-K and all those other programs, because that's where it really needs to be. So one quick thing, I just want to, yes, uh, understood and, and agreed, and we don't have that infrastructure now to, to do what you're talking about. The, the small, it sounded like a small thing that Sarah talked about in the beginning of her testimony, having one site, and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, where if you are, for example, your son or daughter is going into high school, and you just don't know, maybe you're new to the city, maybe you're new to the country, what, what have you, you can go to one site and schedule your visits, your tours. You can look at the videos from those schools to see what is it like? What is it, how does the principal talk about it? You can filter on it, and I get it, not everybody has a computer, not everybody is, is computer literate, but for a lot of parents, that's a huge thing. I don't, I don't know if you heard from your constituents, we certainly heard all the time, having to go site to site to site just to schedule the visits, is brutal, takes hours. I say this in part because I had to do this for my two kids. So there are things like that we can do where the videos really give you a window into what the school is and then we hear you, the infrastructure for more flexibility and choice. Yeah, and, and, and just, just wanna just echo thinking about how are we teaching parents to do those things, right? Because it's one thing to say we have a site and they can go there and do this work, but it's more important of like, how are we starting from you know these pre-K programs and all these things are really how to navigate and really advocate. Because one of the things for me, I knew my daughter and I've been in education for 20 years, so I understood what she needed. I knew she needed an environment where it was not as restrictive and she needed to be free and it had to have art program. I knew those things, but most parents don't know that. So we have to get to a place where we're giving the parents the tools that they need so they can want to advocate for their children and also figure out the schools that they want to be in. But thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Why can't we use library? Library has already existed. You can partner with the libraries in each area, and this is New York City, where people, parents, can actually go to a library and get the tour and get the help and organize it that way. You, that's the, you, that's you may have read our minds, we just had the heads of the different library systems in to meet with Chancellor Banks to talk uh, about just that, uh, council member. Thank you. Happy to follow up on that. We'd love to hear more about how to, how to leverage our relationships with our, with our library partners. So that's gonna be a joint hearing, I hear it. <laughs> um, just, just wanted to emphasize what Councilmember Stevens said, and that's something when we met and I talked about, that parents should have toolkits that they can refer to to navigate the system, because it's complicated. And, we're, and I'm a parent of four that went through the public school system as well. So I know how to navigate that system, but my neighbor may not know. So I've been saying that from day one, we need FAQs for the parents, toolkits for them to navigate the system um, to help support them. And we, this is a conversation we have as you, um, youth chair and ed chair. We talk about this all the time, that we need to start this foundation in elementary. Now when they get to high school, it's already too late. Mm -hmm. Elementary, you build a strong foundation and they should be able to to do this, but I have one question. Since you put up, yes, and to add on DYCD to help do some of that work. <laughs> Bring them in. Bring them in, and we're ready. Um, as you talked about pre-K um, went up today, we get a lot of calls and phone calls about a few things. Um, centralized 3K and PK enrollment process is complicated, difficult to navigate for families. So I'm hoping you're thinking as you're rolling it out to simplify it. As CBOs have previously supported, families were eliminated from enrollment process. What is the DOE doing to ensure families apply to early childhood programs receive effective guidance and support in connecting them to the care option that best meets their preference and needs? You hear that? Preference and needs. Has DOE considered streamlining the process, making it more timely and family friendly, and including CBOs who are often able to offer more culturally and linguistically responsive 
support in navigating eligibility and enrollment care. So for the first time this year, we sent out a spot we sent out spotlight emails to families that highlighted and explained the different program options including FCCs. We hold virtual events for families that are translated. We're always available to support families' questions via email and 311 and in person at our family welcome centers. And we know there's more to do, um, but we're, we're, ready, we're ready and willing to support all families who want a three-k or pre-k option. Are the options listed on your DOE sites? Now? They are. And this year, family child care sites have been included in the central 3K application process. And that's, that's been so for several years. Um, and we're st they were starting, we started it as a pilot, and we're, we expand each year to make sure those FCC sites are up. And clarify, how is the partnership working with ACS and the providers? How does that work? So, I mean, the, the... For your early learn program. Yes. So, the Division of Early Childhood um, really is, uh, leads that partnership with um, ACS. Um, so, I would come back to you with information on that. In terms of um, our enrollment, we work very closely with the Office of Early Childhood to ensure that um, we are making improvements and making things easier for families. Agencies have to talk to each other. We're finding out council members, nobody talk to each other. One agency doesn't know what the other one is doing, but yet you're doing the same work and in the same space. So we would love to see that, better communication. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. We will be limiting public testimony today to three minutes each. For in-person panelists, please come up to the table once your name has been called. For virtual panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to, uh, to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Our first in-person panel will be. Thank you, DOE, for your testimony for today. Thank you. So our, our first in-person panel will be New York City Comptroller Brad Lander and Sadie Campo Amor. You may come up to the table. Wait a minute. You ready for us? <laughs> yes, you may begin your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Joseph and members of the Council's Education Committee. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm also joined by Sadie Campo-Amor, who is the Chief Equity Officer in the Office of the Comptroller uh, and who was previously the Executive Director of Family and Community Empowerment at the DOE and a member of the District 15 Diversity Plan Working Group. Um, this has been a very uh, rich and diverse hearing. Um, public education is, is both the foundation of our democracy, a place where young people learn how to be active members of our diverse society, but also a microcosm of its shortcomings since the patterns of our segregated and unequal world reproduce themselves too much in and through our schools. So it's not a surprise that in the third most segregated city in the country, we have the most segregated school system. And facing up to it honestly uh, is a requirement for us. As a city council member, I began working on confronting school segregation in 2014 on the 60th anniversary of Brown versus Board with uh, staff member Jan Atwell and others who are in the room when the UCLA Civil Rights Project reported that New York had the most segregated schools in the nation. After an extensive council hearing, we passed the School Diversity Accountability Act, um, which required regular reporting and the setting of a real North Star of combating school segregation. Nearly three years later, because of the organizing of young people and communities, 
that school diversity ac accountability group, advisory group, which sounds like it hasn't met in some time, uh, began meeting, and the DOE committed to an active effort to promote diversity in our schools. As part of that initial plan, uh, they offered districts the opportunity to step up and say, we want to do engaged community process that would enable us to confront segregation uh, and promote diversity in our schools. Um, that led to the D15 diversity plan, um, which was developed through uh, a d highly engaged process out in communities in Sunset Park, in Red Hook, uh, in multiple languages. Um, and after an extensive year-long process, that 16-member working group brought to the community an extensive set of recommendations that ultimately involved the removal of all middle school screens, um, an admissions priority for students who qualify as low-income ELL or students in temporary housing at 52 percent, the same percent they are in the district as a whole, and detailed proposals for genuinely supporting that transition with the five R's of real integration and the support that school communities need. Um, I won't go into to all of uh, what it took, but uh, there was enormous joy when that plan was adopted. And I'm pleased to say, despite the pandemic, um, the planning firm WXY Studio is currently working with the District 15 superintendent and the CEC on an evaluation, which will be available later this spring. I've got some bullets on page three, it looks like. Um, uh, which go into, at uh, the middle of page two, I apologize, which go into some of the findings of that. Uh, but, you know, what we're really hearing is that families and staff celebrate the values of the plan, um, find that it's less stressful for students, that there are real challenges like transportation and the loss of Title I funds at schools that had just above 60% students in poverty and now are below and aren't getting Title I funds anymore. So there's a lot we are learning and that I think can serve to advise schools all around uh, the city. Um, that plan in many ways was the model for this law passed, the law that passed that Councilmember Hanif asked about, about doing district level planning those plans, you know, you might have listened to School Colors Season 2 and heard some of the challenges with them. Um, they were put on pause during the pandemic. But what's interesting is the pandemic, of course, forced the suspension of screens much more broadly. And so we've got the chart that I think in some ways Councilmember Aviles was um, requesting that looks at the numbers that DOE spoke about. It's at the back of the testimony um, uh, of the extraordinary drop in screens in middle schools um, all across the city, but really concentrated in districts one, two, three, and 13, which were overwhelmingly screened and are now entirely unscreened. So it's a remarkable set of steps forward, but we do need to use this moment to really understand what's going on in those schools. So I think in place in some ways of what was happening as like, are we going to do it district diversity planning? We could take the model of what D15 is doing now and say, what's going on in those schools and districts and what do we need to actually support the unscreening that's happened to make sure it's genuinely showing up for all those schools and all those students. And I think it really is a, a profound opportunity to take a significant next step forward. Um, uh, if you'll grant it, uh, and I know there's a lot of people here to testify, uh, Sadie has some testimony as well from her experience as a member of that working group about what really made it work. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Joseph, and thank you to the council members and the Education Committee. My name is Sadie Campo Amor. I serve as the Chief Equity Officer to the New York City Comptroller. I am a proud New York City public school graduate, and I'm also a public school parent. So these issues are not only of great professional importance to me, but also personal. Um, I previously served, as mentioned, as the Executive Director of Family and Community Engagement at the New York City Department of Education, and was there uh, also as a lead for the school diversity and integration effort. I come before you today to reiterate what the Comptroller has said, that this is not only a call for moving children of color into predominantly white spaces, as we know that this has caused harm and reinforces mental models that perpetuate both interpersonal and internalized racism. However, uh, and nor is this a call to eliminate or call against for affinity spaces and the need for them for our students. But as a member of the District 15 Diversity Plans Working Group, I recall by being enlightened and educated by student activists from Integrate NYC. Their 5R framework, later adopted by the mayor and the chancellor, 
offers us and the Department of Education in particular an opportunity to divorce itself from 20th century desegregation and an invitation into 21st century integration specifically real integration. So briefly, the five R's are representation that ask us to look at the racial representation of educators in New York City. Uh, right now, teachers self-identify at close to 80% as white women when nearly 85% of our students identify as students of color. Resources ask us to fund schools equitably. It requires us to take an additionally an expansive view on what resources and equitable resources mean. Access to internships, PTA funding, social capital that leads to students' upward mobility. I want to thank and applaud the hard work of the Fair Student Funding Task Force, the mayor and the chancellor for adding the additional weights to the Fair Student Formula as it puts into practice, centering our most institutionally uh, marginalized students. Restorative practices asks us to rethink our approach in relationship to school discipline and who gets suspended. It asks that if we're if and when we integrate schools that we also interrogate what safety means to our students. Real relationships invites school communities to dig deeper into one another. I was born in El Salvador and I am part of the Nahua people. I never heard that country nor those tri that tribe mentioned one time in my K through 12 experience in New York City public schools. The result at best is that I felt unseen and at worst, I felt a sense of shame. We don't want our students to be put in that position ever again. And I wanna just call out that New York City Outward Bound Schools has a way to embed real relationships in their daily practice called CREW. Last but not least, race and enrollment, which speaks to student demographics across the city. 77% of Latin and Latinx students attend schools that are less than 10% white. And according to Stanford University, the average black student in New York City had a poverty rate of 22 percentage points higher than the average white students. Concentrations of poverty are associated with endemic violence, higher levels of stress, disparities in academic achievement, and many other disadvantages. This, coupled with racial isolation, are the conditions that conspire to make segregation so pernicious. Before I go, I wanted to share a few key ingredients that made our District 15 working group successful, and some of those folks are in the room, so just want to give them a shout as well. I want to continue for you to encourage the DOE to follow through on their local law that you passed in 2019, but I also believe in harnessing the best practices so that we can move towards our shared goals. So first, uh, anti-racist and DEI training for all working groups was really helpful because it provided shared language and a student-centered equity lens, which folks need. We provided childcare, we provided meals, translation and interpretation. Our working group was a dual language working group. Transportation, student voice paired with youth adult partnership and practices so that young people at the table can be heard. Um, and data visualization so that it's accessible and transparent. These are not one size fits all models. You guys represent a variety of communities in New York City nor are community-driven processes a destination, but they are a mechanism to foster more integrated school systems and that do more than just move bodies and recreate harm from the past, but critically examine our admissions policies and more. We have educational models to draw from right now, including ICT classes, integrating co-teaching, school-wide enrichment, community schools, community redesign, building utilization, and performance-based assessments. So the invitation today is for us to keep going as if our multiracial democracy depended on it, because it does. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It does. Um, have you uh, reached out or engaged the New York City Public Schools in seeing this model and probably duplicating in other districts? <laughs> yeah, no, and they've been cricket. It's been cricket. It's been <laughs> I mean, and, and you, you know, you heard the prior panel. The um, what's in, you know, the the pandemic shut down the diversity planning processes, um, and it doesn't sound like they have restarted. But I guess what I do, and there's a lot more than middle schools. You know, Correct. what we were doing in District 15 at the end was looking at some of our elementary schools. Given new seat need, you guys talked about what's happening in pre-K and 3K. As you're building a whole new system, it's a perfect time to think about what you might do differently because nobody already has something they're holding on tight to. But I do also think the opportunity to look at the middle schools, as so many of them have been unscreened 
um, would, this would be a good time to kind of combine uh, the practices that worked in the D15 planning process with some of what's new on the ground. I, I guess the way I think of it is like, you don't get to decide whether segregation is okay in your community school district or not. Like we're still the UCLA Civil Rights Project found the most segregated you know, schools in the, in the nation. So we have a collective obligation to move forward, but you want community engagement and real planning about how to look at that and how to move forward through it. And that you've got to start with where you are and we're in a very different place uh, coming out of the pandemic than we were in some places of real opportunity like pre-K and 3K expansion and unscreened middle schools. So this would be a good moment to push forward and that's why we thought your hearing was so Correct, the uh, pandemic important. was a way for us not to go back to normal. Yeah. But I noticed that we went back to same business and we cannot afford to, as you said. So pre-K three would be the opportunity to desegregate and move forward and create models from there. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your testimony. This Thank is, you. And I do have a school in District 15. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you to our first panel. Our next in-person panel will be Julianne Huang, Hudson Chu, Sandra Liu, and Bonnie Chi. Please make your way to the table. You may begin your testimony. Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank Chair Joseph and the Council for allowing this conversation. My name is Julianne Huang, a junior at Staten Island Tech in Staten Island. As the nation's only pan-Asian children's advocacy organization, Coalition for Asian American Children and Families aims to improve the health and well-being of Asian American and Pacific Islander children and families in New York City. I'm a youth advocate of, at the Asian American Student Advocacy Projects anti-bullying and harassment campaign. Our campaign team aims to equip both students and teachers with the necessary means to recognize and properly address cases of bullying, harassment, and to advocate for an all-around safe and affirmative environment in schools. Most bullying is subtle, not loud enough that it's concerning for teachers to take notice, but enough for students to carry it with them for the rest of their adolescence and onwards. And bullying hurts the most when, it's something, when, it's tar when it targets something you can't change about yourself. If a student makes fun of your shirt, you're able to switch it out the next day. But if they make fun of the language your, your, your grandparents are speaking to you when they're picking you up, or the way your eyes are shaped, it isn't so easy to switch those out. In middle school, there were plenty of cases of AAPI students getting picked on for their identity, but these jabs were often disguised as jokes. And if you couldn't take it, you were called weak or sensitive. And these moments went ignored because teachers, administrators, and even fellow students saw these slights as normal behavior, not bullying. But what is bullying? Don't microaggressions count as bullying if they harm your sense of self? Currently at my school, there's only one Respect for All liaison who's responsible for handling any matters of bullying, harassment, discrimination, or intimidation by a student or staff member. There's a video on our school website where our liaison introduces herself and encourages students to come talk to her if they feel like they're harassed in any way. However, in the video and on the website, there isn't much information on what action will be taken after reporting. Simply encouraging students to report is not enough. We must assure them that the help and justice will be restored after they share their vulnerable experiences. In freshman year, one of my friends was cyberbullied for her weight by one of her classmates. She reported it to the school, but very little was done. It was the bully's first offense, so he was let off with simply a warning, with no, intention, with no mention of the impact his actions had on my friend, and no context or understanding, which created the conditions for the cyberbullying to continue. This kind of restorative action is unacceptable. The impact of the harmful actions and comments were not properly addressed, and the care and support my friend deserves was not provided. At CCF and ASAP, we believe that students must feel safe in all aspects of both pre- and post-bullying incidents. Safety is not defined by punishment for wrongdoings, but by the presence of student wellness. Every student deserves to feel safe in their identity. Moving forward, the anti-bullying harassment team at ASAP is happy to work with the Committee of Education together to ensure that all students are seen, heard, and supported in an inclusive school and community. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts. Go ahead. 
Um, good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Chair Joseph and the Council for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Hudson Chu, and I'm a senior at NYC iSchool in Soho. Better? Um, I'm a youth advocate at the Asian American Student Advocacy Project, or ASAP for short. I'm participating in ASAP's mental health campaign, which aims to identify the gaps within mental health education and culturally responsive services in NYC public schools. At CACF and ASAP, we believe every student deserves to feel safe in their school and their own, own identity. Currently, this is not the case. I know that personally, I've been a target of microaggressions from fellow students at school and on occasion from teachers. I'd love to go to school and not be asked if I need a pair of chopsticks or that I, if I've failed my driver's test yet. And I'd love to go to school and not be treated like an exotic beast from faraway land, and yet I can't. I know that my experience with microaggressions and bullying isn't unique, and I know that thousands of other AAPI students in New York City have the same treatment. However, school staff are, are unable to recognize and respond to these microaggressions. Through your support of this task force, you can help start the process of prevention and treatment. Currently, anti-bullying services at my school are minimal at best. There are two guidance counselors for a school of nearly 500 students. As, as I understand it, this is a rather high ratio for a New York City school. These counselors are often unapproachable as being guidance counselors often not their only obligation. For students who might face bullying, care should be present and accessible in a timely manner. I fear that with our current status, there is no support system or safety net for students who might be seriously struggling, which can affect their mental health and overall well-being. Additionally, there are no teachers who regularly monitor the halls during times of class transitions, which sometimes leads to physical altercations or unchecked catcalling and other harassment. I hope that the establishment of a task force can help solve both of these problems, as they could form a standard to hold schools accountable to, both in terms of a counselor to student ratio, as well as a pre regular preventative measures in busy areas on or near school grounds. While we applaud the Education Committee for the call to establish a bullying prevention task force, we'd like to emphasize that the focus on safety should not mean that students are punished for wrongdoing, but instead on making the school a place of student wellness. To address this issue, we hope the city places a priority on education, restorative justice, and healing, as we strongly believe that this will result in the desired outcome of overall improved student wellness. ASAP is ready and willing to work together with the council on the establishment of this task force to ensure that it would create an inclusive and affirming school environment and hold our schools accountable. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon. First, I would like to thank Chair Joseph and the council for allowing this conversation. My name is Sandra, and I'm a high school student in New York City. I'm a youth advocate at the Asian American Student Ad Advocacy Project's anti-bullying and harassment campaign. ASAP is a youth leadership program for AAPI youth from across New York City. Our campaign team aims to empower and prepare AAPI youth for when they're faced with race-based bullying and harassment, and to advocate for more transparent safety measures for students within the public school systems through workshops and trainings. My favorite day, time of the day in elementary school was undoubtedly snack time. I still vividly recall my classmates and my joy as we sped walk to the cubby in the front of the room to see what foods we each brought to eat that day. Cookies, chips, pretzels, and even the occasional brownie or cupcake that everyone envied. One afternoon, one of my friends brought dried anchovies as her snack, a flavorful Asian delicacy. However, my teacher felt concerned about her snack choice and offered her goldfish crackers instead. While my friend and I thought nothing much of it afterwards, I remember feeling confused as to why it was only her snack that was being replaced. This memory has stuck with me for years, but it wasn't until recently that I recognized it as a form of micro-invalidation. Even though my teacher had the intention of being caring rather than disrespectful, my teacher's actions indirectly implied that in a classroom setting, cultural food is less acceptable than the mainstream snacks that we find at grocery stores. Oftentimes, the definition of bullying places an emphasis on physical violence, and emotional and verbal bullying, such as microaggressions, are hardly mentioned. Often, people, including students and teachers engaging in these microaggressions, may not even be aware of the impact of their words or actions. Because microaggressions may be unintentional and or normalized, they can be hard to detect. Despite this, they can still perpetuate harmful stereotypes and are still hurtful to targeted individuals. When continually faced with microaggressions, AAPI students may feel sidelined in school, which is an environment teachers, administrators, and students all have a hand in creating. As students, we deserve to feel safe about our own identities in our school. There should be more steps taken to ensure that microaggressions are properly addressed. Most of the time, microaggressions stem from a gap in knowledge about various cultures or incorrect stereotypes. 
We hope that schools will address this issue by holding more town halls and workshops where students and teachers can discuss microaggressions and their experiences. These conversations will hopefully result in students and staff having a better understanding of each other, leading to less assumptions being circulated in schools. ASOP is ready to work with the Committee on, of Education on this task force to ensure that we can implement solutions like these and can work together to make schools a safer community. Thank you so much for your time. Um, good morning. First, I want to thank Chair Joseph and the council for allowing this conversation. My name is Bonnie Shi, and I'm a student at a New York City public high school. I'm a youth advocate at the Asian American Student Advocacy Project's Language Access Campaign, and our campaign aims to gather AAPI youth to share their personal story and advocate for English language learner inclusion by addressing social stigma and barriers they face in public schools. Bullying has been prevalent in the school system for a long time. It can range from violence to microaggressions. Even small hateful remarks can cause lasting harm towards individuals. It is never okay to normalize violence, and it is not okay to normalize the small jokes people say to others that are different from them. It is also not normal for my friend to have no source of support or care after being bullied for her identity. I mean, who was she supposed to turn to? Teachers that always seem to be busy, guidance counselors that she never knew existed, or her parents who, want, who wanted to lay low and didn't want to cause any trouble for the school. We all know bullying is a long unaddressed issue in schools and it calls for attention. As an AAPI, it could be super hard to speak up about bullying. My parents are first generation immigrants and they had a hard time adjusting to the customs of this country. From a young age, I was told not to cause trouble. For many of my friends who are AAPI English language learners, people make fun of their first language and the way to, they speak too often. No one should be made fun of be just because English is not their first language. School should be a place where all identities and languages are welcomed and cherished. For AAPI youth, um, bullying can take forms of microaggressions, which is which can seem like a small case from the teacher's perspective. That really made it hard for, for me to talk about when people started singling out for my identity, especially my race, calling me to go back to where you came from, or even snickering behind my back. Even then, I never knew of telling an adult because I never knew that was considered bullying. These incidents happened in school hallways, classrooms, and open spaces, yet no teacher did anything in response to them. In CACF and ASAP, we believe that every student, regardless of their identity, should feel safe in schools. Schools shouldn't feel like a place where people get to judge you based on their identity. We believe that safety, safety isn't policing students or punishing students for the wrongdoings, but that safety is the presence of student wellness. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Shika. Just wanted to say to you all, thank you so much uh, for your testimony today, too, and for speaking out so powerfully uh, against bullying and microaggressions. And as, as an Asian American child myself one day, too, uh, in your shoes not so long ago, you know, I think one of the most powerful ways to end this kind of bullying and stigma um, is to speak out exactly how you're doing um, and to raise a visibility of us um, as youth, as communities, um, and to be uh, unafraid in doing so. And uh, those are the values that I teach my children too that are now seven and four and we talk about bullying and you all are exemplifying it too. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Our next panel will be Kaushik Das, Alyssa O'Shea, Stephen Stowe, and Naya Bird. Please come up to the table. You may begin your testimony, Kaushik. Yeah, we'll oh. start with Kaushik and go down. Uh, we didn't see. 
I'm Koshik. Oh, okay. 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 So we'll start with <laughs> Koshik Das, then Alyssa O'Shea, then Stephen Stowe, and then Nyber. Okay. Uh, thank you for having us, although I'm disappointed that a lot of the council members couldn't stay, uh, as well as the members of the DOE, because my comments aren't meant for them. But I'll speak to who is, who is remaining, and thank you for staying. I'm the Vice President of District 2, which is one of the largest dist uh, my president couldn't attend. I do speak beha on behalf of most of my, of, of actually all the officers who are in agreement on this. Uh, we are the, we represent the largest district, in, one of the largest districts in New York City, depending on how you cut it, whether it's students, number of schools, uh, geographic area. We represent 40% of Manhattan, so I'm particularly disappointed that Eric Botcher and Julie Menon couldn't stay. In any case, I'm going to talk today about D2 is broadly bashed for being one of the wealthiest and often white and Asian, which often is equated with privilege, and I resent that the Asians are often associated that way. But despite the fact that it might be one of the wealthiest districts, it also has the most disparity of haves and haves nots, and it has the largest influx of asylum seeking students. So I absolutely resent on what's happened in admissions in District 2. <clears throat> I often like what the Chancellor has to say. I like what he has about to say about the four pillars, uh, for his four pillars. That has not been the experience of what's happened in District 2. Broadly speaking, admissions criteria has not worked in, in our district. It did not work under the de Blasio administration, which, it, which was characterized by an uninspired lottery and lowering of standards, as Council Member Denovitz mentioned. The current chancellor and mayor asked us to give him a chance, but after two years of, of admission cycles, it continues to not work for us. District 2 enrollment from pre-K through 8th grade has dropped by almost 7,150 students, or 26%, from 2019 to 2022. To put it in perspective, that's almost the size of one of the smaller educational districts in our city. It hasn't worked on the high school level. Despite, an, <clears throat> despite an improving a complicated bucketing system, it continues to rely on, on lottery, no state test, and despite the fact that 90%, and this is despite the fact that 90% of students took the state test last year, and that we have systems in place like NWA and other systems in our, in our, in our uh, school systems. It has not worked on the middle school level. It has failed to offer screening uh, <clears throat> and any above grade learning in ELA, social studies, languages, as well as science for two over the three years. It has not worked for G&T expansion. We have only, after two years, we have only one additional classroom and continued subjective measures that basically funnel into yet another lottery system, yet another instance of DOE Powerball. <clears throat> for middle school admissions, our council took the unusual measure of a second vote of no confidence this January, after a first in our superintendent. This is after a first vote of no confidence in December, after rejecting his, his middle school plan the, the, year, the month before, and after we ourselves had laid out a detailed plan in October, which offered a mix of lottery, screen schools, schools that offered accelerated courses within, their, within the schools, as well as a variety of other plans, including dual language programs. Only one of these suggestions was taken. <clears throat> the DOE came here and said that they've been responsive to our community. They have not. In every one of our engagements, whether, this, whether it was from the DOE the C, the, or the CEC, parents overwhelmingly spoke in favor of screened admissions in middle school, and a range of choices for, for, uh, for our students. <clears throat> what was most egregious is that our superintendent went out of his way to, to engage the Chinatown and Chinese-speaking community and in, in an engagement in, I believe, September or October, and that video was lost, even though <laughs> those parents unanimously spoke in favor of the screened mission. Not only did they speak unanimously in favor of it, they did not even understand the concepts of lottery or why students would be chosen on such, on such grounds. <clears throat> the, margin, the majority of CEC D2 also pointed out that District 2 was awarded a $3.2 million grant for the New York State Integration Project, a phase three grant from, from NYSED. And the majority of CEC D2 thinks that the superintendent is in violation of this grant, is in violation of state law, and is misallocating NYSED funds for integration for the purposes that they were not intended. Regarding high school admissions, we have District 2 priority was removed under, under de Blasio, uh, despite the fact that many of our high schools were created be, to address the fact that there were not enough seats for our graduating students in District 2 and Manhattan. As a result, 18% of the students received none of their 12 choices, and uh, this was 11% for all of Manhattan. Despite this fact, under the current chance, under the continuing plan, uh, this was not changed, and again, 
for another year, 18% of our students in our district and 11% of Manhattan students received none of their 12 choices. There is still continued to be no change for this year. Regarding GNT, so to date, we have one additional third grade class despite overwhelming demand in our district and another year of de facto lottery. And it's de facto lottery, and I've, even though I have asked the superintendent and, the, and enrollment to look into this, there have been many, many cases of te many teachers who, who recommend all of their students or none of their students, either because they don't, either because they believe, don't believe in the system or believe that all, all children are gifted. All children may be gifted, but not all children are academically gifted, just like all, all children are not designated, designed to be base, basketball stars, swimmer, excellent swimmers, Olympic athletes, uh, World Cup soccer players, or the like. I'd also like to reject the notion a little bit that we have the most segregated school system. We don't. We have the most segregated housing system, which results in schools that, are that reflect their community. And it is, the onus is not on the DOE or parents to fix this. The onus, is, the onus is, on, is to fix the housing, if that's what you choose to desire. I also caution against the D15 plan, which has been touted many times today. There's dubious evidence that diversity was, was increased. However, there is plenty of evidence that the transportation time of all students was increased. There's also evidence that, ev that enrollment de decreased even before COVID. What there is no evidence of in this plan is no evidence that academic outcomes actually improved, which is often the touted reason why we should improve our, our, our diversity. I categorically reject the notion that, that, was, that was presented by Lincoln Ressler that lottery uh, increases diversity. The experiences in our district point that to be exactly not the case. Several principals have pointed out that after the introduction of lottery, diversity decreased. Basically, schools that were in Chinatown reflected more Chinese students. Schools that were in white neighborhoods had more white students at the end of lottery. And this effect has never been, has never been in, looked at, and we just always tout it instantly. This is, this is a great plan. This is increasing diversity, and it increases educational outcomes, which it has never, ever, ever shown to be the case. And lastly, regarding educational outcomes, <laughs> we always talk about how, what, how diversity should be increased, and that improves educational outcomes. A lot of the lot of, uh, United States ranks very poorly compared to their peers in in science, in math, even reading, even English, and certainly in languages, broadly speaking. New York is no, is no standout among our, our 50 states in that regard. We always say that we point to diversity. A lot of these international school systems don't have a lot of diversity in their systems, yet they produce better outcomes. What parents want is better schools for their children. They don't want to, be, they want to, they don't want to travel large distances for a diversity that may or may not improve educational outcomes for the system. They want educational, better educational outcomes for their children where they live. And the end and all be and all should not be to increase diversity, but to edu improve our outcomes. And the goal should not be to change the goal line at the high school level or even at the middle school level, because studies show that that's too late. We need to fix math standards and reading comprehension standards by kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade at the latest, and not change the finish line at the middle school and high school level. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your testimony. Next person. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Elisa O'Shea. I am the parent elected representative from Queens on the Citywide Council on High Schools. We represent approximately 320,000 families in the public school system and I'd like to say thank you, Council Member Joseph, for attending our meeting last month. We encourage all city council members to drop in whenever they want and come by and say hello. I'm going to relay a brief history of our council's engagement over high school admission policies with our stakeholders and the NYC DOE, as well as our recommendations moving forward. CCHS recommended tightening academic bands for the current admission cycle. We feel that merit and hard work should be recognized in the placement process. In the previous admission cycle, we received feedback that tier one was too broad and did not yield proper placements for many families. We also advocated for the expansion of waitlist timelines and increased transparency around the realistic chances of attaining, obtaining a seat in a waitlisted school. What if a scholar didn't get any of their 12 choices? CCHS worked closely with OSE to develop questionnaires and outreach to these students. We received many complaints around this in the 2021-22 term, particularly in Manhattan's District 2. 
we saw data exhibiting an overall skew against placing students of Asian descent in their listed choices. My fear is that many families simply left the system if they had the means, instead of choosing to navigate a confusing system of waitlists and random placements far from home. CCHS also advocated for geographic priority, especially in the borough of Queens, where there is an enormous need for high school seats that far outweighs availability. We also advocated this year for streamlined applications on an earlier timeline, which DOE responded to. CCHS successfully advocated for OSC to publish assigned numbers for student lottery numbers in their My Schools account. Yet many families still do not understand the key role that lottery numbers play in how a school ranks them, and we call for more transparency around how these numbers are formulated. CCHS does not believe that lottery numbers are the answer for increasing diversity. So what will increase diversity? Academic environments in elementary and middle schools that lead to preparedness for our high schools. CCHS would like to see a return to algebra for all being offered in all middle schools. We must recover from pandemic learning loss and strongly focus on mathematics and literacy to elevate our scholars' scores and abilities. Another suggestion is to begin CTE and STEM-oriented programs earlier in middle school so students have a defined idea of what they might want to explore in the high school level. New York City has approximately 400 high schools with 700 different programs. Of these, an estimated 15% have traditionally used screens based on academic performance of applicants to select admitted students. We would also like to see more outreach for Shazat materials and preparations offered in multiple languages, especially to our seventh and eighth grade families in underserved districts. CCHS believes that this will increase community knowledge of available SHS accelerated learning academies while increasing diversity and academic outcomes for our families. We wholeheartedly support Chancellor Banks' promise for the development of accelerated learning environments in Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Southeast Queens, and we advocate for the construction of additional specialized high schools, especially in Queens. CCHS would like to see a return to individual schools designing screen criteria that fits their mission and learning environment. We strongly advocate for a return to include uh, state test scores in the admissions process, and we hope to work with NYC DOA to reinstate this important criterion. And I'll just close with this. We want our students to be in an appropriate learning environment where they are met at their entry point, wherever that is, and then challenged to expand and properly prepare for higher education and career training programs. One additional suggestion is to create and fund high school bridge programs for remedial skills for incoming ninth graders so they are ready to learn starting in September when they go to high school. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. Next person. Who is the next? Do you want Steve or Maya? Steve Insel. Sure. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Joseph. It's nice to see you again. Um, and good afternoon, remaining members of the Education Committee um, and those online. Uh, my name is Steven Stowe. I serve as president of the Community Education Council for District 20 in Southwest Brooklyn. Um, the comments are my own, although our CEC has passed several resolutions supporting many of the comments I will make. Before my prepared statement, I just want to address a point made earlier by Council Member Alexa Avilas, um, who um, has represented many of the families in my district. Um, she pointed out that there was a, a G&T program in District 15 that only had 11 students and used that to question the validity of the whole G&T model. I point out that almost every G&T program has more demand than available seats. The classroom in D15 with 11 students was an exception. It's important to ask if programs are being established in areas where they are in demand and if they are being marketed and advertised widely. I know there are many, many families in D15 that want a G&T program but may not have been aware or close to this particular program. As for the admissions process, thanks to the DOE for hearing the families that asked to modify admissions policies for accelerated programs and move away from lotteries. I like the third grade on-ramp for G&T. I like giving superintendents the flexibility to program their districts, but there's room for improvement. First, all the new admissions policies based on grades and teacher evaluations are inherently subject to human bias. The kindergarten GNT admission requires a parent request their child be evaluated. This will inherently favor parents who are in the know or are motivated. Parents who are too busy or otherwise unaware will not make the request. Their kids will fall through the cracks. It is also a very short time frame to evaluate uh, children. 
in the current evaluation framework teachers used is biased towards children who are more vocal at a young age. This will surely exclude large numbers of quieter, gifted learners. And teachers are being asked to evaluate kids on dozens of areas. Each teacher's methods will vary widely. We especially need to consider that many teachers may be ideologically opposed to gifted and talented. Second, there are also bias concerns in the use of grades as a sole determinant for the third grade GNT admissions and the middle school screened admissions. If you care about equity and we want to address biases in the current policies, the DOE needs to include some type of universal assessment in their admissions policies. If grades are retained as part of admissions, I suggest a method where you use the um, uh, grades above a given teacher's um, historical grading average. If a student achieves a certain percentage level above a teacher's average, that will account for teachers who are just stricter graders. Finally, while I applaud the decision to allow district superintendents to decide on middle school screened admissions, there will be situations in which parents and superintendents disagree. It is a very important decision and there needs to be a feedback process. Engagement on the middle school screening process varied widely by district. I want to point out that simply engaging DOE staff, such as principals, does not substitute for engaging parents who are the most important stakeholders in this decision. Superintendents must be inclusive of all viewpoints in their community, not wedded to a particular ideology they may have learned in graduate school or their experience to date. This brings us to one of the most important areas for reform, the superintendent evaluation process. Despite being enshrined in state law 2590E, the current process is meaningless, CECs submit an annual superintendent evaluation, but the DOE does not provide responses or engage in discussions and has no incentive to. I encourage the City Council to take up the issue of reform of the superintendent evaluation process as the debate over mayoral control extension heats up again very soon. I happen to think this is a rare area in which parents who often disagree on education issues might actually be able to find some common ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Bird. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Naya Berg and I'm the Executive Director at New York Appleseed, a nonprofit that advocates for integrated schools and communities in New York City and state. For years, the middle and high school admissions process in New York City has been notoriously cumbersome, stressful, and complex. The New York City high school application process is not unlike the process of applying to college. We ask students and families to research a list of well over 100 schools. We ask them to narrow that down to 12 choices by searching through an online platform, maybe attending tours, figuring out open houses, going to interviews, maybe sometimes submitting auditions, sometimes writing multiple personal essays. And for the best shot, at several of the most coveted schools, we require students to ensure that they have at least a nine year above average from seventh grade with few exceptions. And we ask them to do all of these things with the expectation they can figure out the system primarily in English and with the aid of a supposedly well-informed and supposedly available counselor. The high school application process, that's what it is now. And this is, is still leaps and bounds better than what it was several years ago thanks to changes that were made in 2020, 2021, and that were further sustained this year. The middle school application process also was made unnecessarily complex, largely due to rampant use of exclusive selection criteria that also saw welcomed reform in 2020 with a two-year pause on screening that led to increases in access for marginalized students. These policy changes made over the last three years serves important prerequisites to building a more equitable and just admissions process, and yet decisions made this year did not sustain them all. One of the most egregious reversals of policy was the reinstatement of screening at public middle schools at the discretion of district superintendents, despite years of advocacy, research, and reports demonstrating their detrimental and segregative effect. It was also concerning to hear the chancellor defend his changes through statements at an event, such as if you have a child who works really hard on the weekends and puts in their time and energy and have a 98 average, they should have a better opportunity to get into a high choice school than a child you have to throw water on their face to get to school every day. This callous reasoning behind changes that affects hundreds of students and families was alarming. It lacks empathy for the daily lives of students. It lacks an understanding of the influence systemic inequities have on students and traditional measures of achievement. And it lacks awareness that many of our students are still reeling from trauma due to the COVID-19 pandemic. All students, regardless of income, language, race, ability, or housing status, deserve the opportunity to thrive in high quality public schools excuse me, high quality public schools, and our enrollment policies should reflect that. We have set aside a few recommendations. We have elaborated the, with those in our written testimony. 
that would go to supporting under-resourced students and families in the high school admissions process, such as mandating funding um, to develop standardized curriculums that would be integrated into middle schools, into after-school enrichment programs to help families better navigate the high school application process, investing in guidance counselors and professional development, uh, making selection criteria in print rather than just in line to have better access to these platforms and also to make sure that we are implementing Local Law 225, which I was thankful to the council for asking questions about today, as well as recommitting to the progress um, of the over 60 goals that have been outlined that are still living on the website today and our Diversity in Our Schools website page on the Department of Education. I'll, I'll wrap up with saying that, that segregation is an intentional choice, and to dismantle it, we must be just as intentional in our reforms. Our enrollment policies matter, and they can be catalysts for integration or sustainers of segregation. We implore leadership to continue to center equity, excellence, and diversity in policymaking to avoid the doomed alternative of trying to create separate but equal schools. Thank you for having this oversight hearing today. Thank you so much for your testimonies. Thank you. Thank you so much to this panel. We will now move on to our final in-person panel. Jennifer Chu, Zarif Pineda, and Ursula Jung. Apologies if I mispronounced anything. Jennifer, when you're ready, you may begin. Yes, okay, um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jennifer Che. I am a Queens resident, a parent of two high school students with IEPs, and a special education advocate at Special Support Services. I am also the founder of a 700 member group called New York City Parents of Teens with Disabilities. For students with disabilities, when it comes to high school admissions, the DOE states, Every DOE middle school and high school welcomes and serves students with disabilities according to their IEPs. But what they don't state is that they will not supervise the school open houses and tours in which parents are directly or indirectly told that the school will only provide some, but not all, of these services. Some of the things that the parents will hear, things like, Related services will have to be provided outside of school, and this puts the onus on the parent to ensure services. They'll hear, we do not offer integrated co-teaching, otherwise known as ICT, a special education service, for world language classes, even though you need that to graduate with a Regents Diploma. There are no ICT services for AP classes, is something that they'll hear even though those classes are also used towards completing a high school diploma. They are told that there are no self-contained classes, which is very bad considering that some of these schools are specialized in offering career technical education programs. Likewise, these schools will tell parents that ICT services are not offered in career technical education classes as well. Some of the specialized high schools will take weeks to respond to parents for simple special education questions. And the parents take that delay as, don't come here. Some will even tell parents that they will amend the IEP to remove ICT from, their, from the student so that the student could take an AP class. And that is against federal policy also against federal policy is when a, st a student gets into a GNT school and then upon arrival they will be asked to remove ICT off their IEP. Some parents even hear that the school's trajectory is to declassify the student towards the end of high school because there's no special education co in college. That's the reason. So this tells parents what? That if they need to have services in 12th grade they shouldn't come to that school. What ends up happening after parents hears these messages is what I call self-serve discrimination because the messages make parents choose other schools so that these non-inclusive schools will never be forced to provide the services, I'm almost done, to provide the services to students with disabilities. 
Even if the parent is willing to fight when they get in there that first year, that student is at risk, obviously, because the school is leaning towards not providing services, and they made that clear. I'm asking the Education Committee to please investigate these matters. Please ask high school superintendents and the enrollment office if they have been told about these activities and what they have done about it. Please also read the Chalkbeat article entitled, Many High Schools Are Off Limits to Students with Disabilities. More importantly, please examine the schools who are doing it right. Townsend Harris High School in Queens is a model of top level education in this country. And it is also a model of special education support services here in this city. They are proving to this city that parents do not have to choose between their child's education and their child's disability supports. The Queens North High School Superintendent's Office also provides exemplary services to parents. Both institutions look at special education more as a point of excellence rather than a miserable point of compliance. This is what makes students feel safe and included. There's more in my testimony, but I know my time's up. Thank you. Barith Panetta. Thank you, Council. Thank you for saying this late. Um, my name is Sarah Pineda. I am the founder and executive director of Territorial Empathy, the Urban Equity Design Collective. I'm also an adjunct associate at Columbia University in the Applied Analytics Program in Urban Design. Also, I led the working group of the District 15 Diversity Plan, where I worked on community engagement, urban analytics, and policy design. For the past six years, I've researched school segregation in New York City. My team created Segregation is Killing Us, the first investigation into the disparate um, casualties of COVID-19 in communities of color throughout NYC. And a responsive high school admissions policy to support these vulnerable families, which I would love for the council to look into because we provided this to the DOE. We created it with Intergrade NYC. It was modeled by MIT and it proved incredible outcomes. It just, there was a failure of implementation with the new administration, unfortunately. It's also unfortunate that students and uh, nonprofit organizations have to come up with educational policy. Uh, we've also created the Real Integration Hub, which you could find at um, integrationhub.nyc, um, the city's first school integration archive, documenting decades of activism, policy, and data in partnership with the NYU Metro Center. Um, as someone who has worked on thoughtful desegregation processes in the city, I know we can and must do better than what the current chancellor and mayor have proposed in terms of admissions and funding policy. Accelerated learning academies are not enough and are a long-term band-aid to historic and systemic policy errors. As we continue to grapple with the impacts of the pandemic, we must realize that black and brown families have suffered disproportionately. In New York City, you are two times more likely to be infected and three times more likely to die if you belong to any of these racial groups. Beyond these mortality and morbidity ca um, casualties, these children are facing much wider educational gaps in all subject areas. Instituting policies that maintain or reverse the progress in integration is pernicious and can have irre irreparable and generational consequences. Currently, 72% of DOE students live in poverty and 104,000 of them are in temporary housing. And while almost 70% of the students are BIPOC, identify as BIPOC, only 7% of schools have diversity in admissions programs. And um, to contradict what uh, the DOE folks, they do, uh, we monitor them, that's available on the Real Integration Hub, and they do, all, they do not meet the targets set forward. Only these 212 programs only exist in 138 schools, which is egregious since the DOE um, has uh, almost 2,000 schools. While some groups are threatened by these initiatives, these DIA initiatives, incite a mass exodus of students from the system, an analysis of uh, data spanning the last five school years shows us that it is the most vulnerable families making that difficult choice. We have seen a 13% decrease in poor students, a 14% decrease in black students, and a, yet we have a 6% increase on students not in poverty. Um, I think it's worth noting that Brooklyn has lost a record 17,000 black students. This system is failing BIPOC families. 
Currently, we are noticing these disastrous impacts in districts 12 and 18 mostly, where there's been a 23% drop in the student body. In closing, I'd like to share some of the data outcomes of the D District 15 diversity plan, which we do have, and um, more outcomes are being released soon. Um, the plan removed screens, as you all know, and created a priority for FRL, ELL, and STL students. And this is what we found. There was no white flight. In fact, there was a, an increase in white and Asian families enrolling in the district. It improved uh, racial and socioeconomic diversity, and it increased first choice match. Do not be afraid of the loud voices disparaging these efforts. It is high time the most diverse city in the world stopped having one of the most segregated school districts in the country. There are community groups, educators, families, students, and researchers that have developed proven policy alternatives. I ask that you create the space and the time to meaningfully engage them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ursula. I'm going to make myself very popular by keeping this short since I'm the last one to go. Uh, my name is Ursula and I am a member on CEC3. I'm here to speak against the lack of objective measures in assessing students across the board in New York City public schools and in particular for admissions to screened programs which were referenced a lot by various council members, especially on this side of the room, I felt. Um, the demand for these type of programs, we know, far exceeds the supply of seats, and perhaps expanding them is the solution to the shocking enrollment decline that we're seeing across the city. Objective type exams, administered under controlled conditions with well-defined criteria, are generally more reliable indicators of performance. These tests are not colored by a teacher's preconceptions of a student and cannot influence marking. They allow educators to compare students' knowledge and identify learning gaps. Jeff, Joseph, as a former educator, you're well aware that in New York City, we've been seeing rampant grade inflation over the past decade plus, <coughs> which means that our children's grades, and I have two children, uh, do not reflect necessarily what New York City students continue to learn in both math and reading. This is compared to students across the state as well as ac across the country. This tactic is being used to cover underperformance by New York City schools. Over the past two years, middle school and high school admissions based on school grades alone have resulted in a wide range of abilities across classrooms that we cannot fairly expect teachers to address in an adequate manner. Not to mention the fact that this is harming students across the board, both those who can do more accelerated work as well as those who are unable to keep pace. At the kindergarten level, the DOE has not announced any criteria for identifying eligible students for accelerated programs. Even as parents are told they can choose them on the application, there is a lack of clear criteria. When they will be announced or who might qualify. In a process that many parents view as fraught already, though I strongly believe that it would not be if we had more quality schools that we could apply to, this is causing even more stress. I urge you to consider the widespread adoption of objective testing and other measures so that we can identify learning gaps, ensure educational integrity, and help raise the standards of students across New York City. I get the prize for finishing under the clock today. <laughs> for your testimony. Thank you so much to all of our in-person panelists. If there's anybody else in the room who wishes to testify, please make your way to the Sergeant at Arms desk. Okay, if not, we are going to move on to our virtual panelists. As a reminder, please um, wait for the Sergeant at Arms to give you a go ahead before your testimony. Our first virtual panel will be Kulsum Tapal, Ellen McHugh, Jenna Provenzano, Kulsun Tapal. Hi everyone, thank you so much Sorry, for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Kulsun Tapal and I'm the Education Policy Coordinator representing the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, otherwise known as CACF. We're the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization, bringing together community partners and youth to fight for equity for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Exclusion, exclusion from curriculum has contributed to long-standing erasure and is a root cause of violence and harassment towards AAPI people. 
The historic and present erasure has created a seemingly endless cycle of violence and anti-Asian hate incidents both inside and outside the classroom. In 2020, Stop AAPI Hate found that one in four Asian youths experienced racist bullying in schools. Infusing AAPI curricular materials in schools is one crucial way we can address racially charged bullying while combating ignorance around AAPI communities that leads to hate, as it is helpful as it can be helpful in dispelling myths, addressing stereotypes, and preventing misunderstandings that can create animosity between students. As advocates for the most marginalized Asian American students, English language learners, immigrants, low-income students, and students with disabilities, CACF sees an urgent need for meaningful schools admission, school admissions reform that accounts for the barriers these students face, alongside in-language, culturally responsive outreach to underserved communities. New York City schools are the most segregated in the U.S., as we've heard today. So it's imperative that this task force addresses this complex issue with a multi-pronged approach. As such, we emphasize that the task force, um, the anti-bullying task force must one, include representation from the AAPI community, two, consider AAPI curricula as a solution to preventing bullying, and three, mandate reporting of disaggregated data on bullying students of color face in New York City public schools. Additionally, we also ask the Department of Education, one, present disaggregated admissions data for AAPI students, and two, commit to admissions integration and providing accessible resources in language to support AAPI families. Thank you. Ellen McHugh. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'd especially like to thank Chairperson Josephs for her comments about individuals who have disabilities and her questions. They are long, there were long questions quickly answered, but gave a good deal of information about how people perceive students with disabilities. I am a parent of a child who is deaf. Part of his, <laughs> excuse me, part of my support is for supporting the anti-bullying curricula that, uh, this, that has been mentioned. Bullying occurs, of course, we know in many, many ways. When my son was learning sign language, a teacher in a school made a crack that it would be really great for him to learn sign language because everybody would think he was Italian and he'd fit in. It took me a good five to 10 minutes to just absorb the double discrepancy in her comments. And, that this, and, and the idea that she could be so cruel to both my son, who is deaf, and to people who have a certain ethnic background. It was one of the few times that I was really relieved that my son could not hear an adult speak. We have, um, I sit on the Citywide Council on Special Education. This is my testimony only. I have not uh, gotten any um, information from other members and I'm sure that they will submit their own testimony if not publicly testify today. But one of the issues of course is access. And for individuals with disabilities, it's not just access to the building, it's access to the programs. In many cases, staff at schools where children are currently cited or staff at schools where children are applying to make a broad assumption that individuals with IEPs cannot be considered to be gifted and talented or colloquially known as 2E kids. I would urge the council to ask for information from all of the schools, not just the schools that have gifted and talented programs, about the ratios of representation for all students with disabilities. Because at this point in time, we have a confused education system. We have students who are district level, um, receiving district level services and can be considered as district level kids with special needs. And we have students who receive services from citywide programs and can be considered as non-residents of the school where they are cited, unless they are in a self-contained building that serves only students 
who are uh, classified as District 75 Sorry, eligible. Thank you for your note. Thank you for on the time limit. Thank you for your time. Uh, my written presentation will be sent in within the 72 hours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before our last person on this panel, our following panel will be Lupe Hernandez, Casey Cohn, and Shen Kwok. So Jenna Provenzano. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jenna Provenzano. I am the Youth Transition Specialist at uh, Center for Independence of the Disabled, CINI. CINI's mission is to ensure full integration, independence, and equal opportunity for all people with disabilities by removing barriers to social, economic, and cultural and civic life of the community. Today, Sydney joins as hearing advocate in support of the establishment of, the, of an anti-billing tax force in New York City schools, as outlined in INT 0038. The New York City Department of Education is one of the largest public school systems in the nation and serves students for representing race, genders, national origin, social orientation, social economic status, and disability identity. Historically, differences across these kinds of groups have been known to cause feelings of otherness and lead to increased opportunity for bullying. Recent data indicates that these have made increased incidents in incidents of bullying in the New York City schools, owning import social is isolation of students experienced during the period of school closures. Furthermore, students with disabilities are more likely to be victims of bullying because of behaviors stemming from their disabilities and that they are, are often a response to unmet special, special education needs, unmet special education needs. Students who are bullied may suffer long-term effects that interfere with their daily lives or social emotional state. Bullying and otherness in key, are key contribu contribu contributors to stigma surrounding marginalized groups, especially those with disabilities. This stigma often leads to negative self-identification for students with disabilities. In some cases, stigma leads children, leads children and families to avoid disability diagnosis as a means of avoiding the negative social ramifications, which also limits the scopes of services and supports that students ultimately were, uh, resulting in less dis desirable academic outcomes. Along with this, some of the long-term effects of filling can prompt disability anxiety and depression and the serious threat of the potential physical injury. All students should feel safe in school. In fact, some students have the right to attend a school where they are safe and supported and that there is no bullying, harassment, or discrimination. Bullying of students because, because of their disability can also be a violation of their right under the law of free and appropriate public, edu public education. Sydney advocates for this right to safe, equitable, accessible, and social fulfilling education for all students with disabilities. And we believe that the implication of INT 0 0 oh, Okay. My time's up? You can continue. Okay, zero three in key steps towards this. And it should be called a task force to keenly examine disability related bullying prevention protocols. The proposed task force in the bill would better support current policies through the import reinforcement of the conflict resolution experts in bullying prevention, mental health counselors, and other school safety education. Um, however, in addition, these Initiative CINI also is advocating for the disability literacy to be included in the school and the safety education. Students with disabilities are more often targeted for bullying than other students, and CINI believes that understanding and addressing these reasons why this is the case for the first step in towards generating effective uh, prevention efforts with the increase of bullying schools, CINI believes that timing of the implementation of the task force is crucial and fully supports the initiatives that protect our most marginalized students. And is also testifying today to indicate our support for regarding the bicycle safety in schools for resolution. Um, CINI has been pursuing advocacy efforts to make New York City streets and sidewalks safer for all regarding 
the recreational use of bicycles or e-bikes, which have become a major safety issue with people for disabilities. We firmly support these efforts to address the important safety concern and are glad to learn the resolutions and the positive changes it aims to achieve in cycling safety at the school level. Uh, thank you and thank you for the extended time. And I'll submit uh, the written version in the 72 hours. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, before we move on to the next panel, panel just as a reminder, um, if you haven't done so, you can email your testimony to the email provided in the invite and it's also on the council website. Our next panel will be Lupe Hernandez, Casey Cohen, and Jen Kwok, followed by our third panel, Nikos Papa Giorgio, Gavin Healy, and Derek Tan. Lupe Hernandez. Hi, thank you so much, um, Chair and Council members that are still here. And um, I want to uplift a lot what was said before me. My name is Lupe Hernandez. Um, I am one of the borough president appointees on the Community Education Council for District 2, but today's um, speaking and testimony will be on behalf of myself as a parent, an NYC parent. I have a fourth grader at my local zone school in an ICT classroom with 100% para 101. He is on the autism spectrum. Uh, he has been in the DOE since early intervention, diagnosed at a really early age. And I've spent the past seven years advocating for him in the Department of Education. And I thank you all um, who have heard me speak on behalf of students with disabilities and the many plights that this system has caused for families, bearing the impact and the weight of trying to get what is legally barely mandated for our students. Um, but today I am here to really uplift um, the admissions that we're speaking about. I have, uh, I'm also a parent of a three-year-old. He just turned three this month. And um, I could tell you from experience that I was devastated to hear the break and promise of universal 3K for all, but I can't tell you how more infuriated I am being that I live in this space, in this education space as an advocate. I sit on the council. I've worked with enrollment office and I wanna thank them for a lot of the data that they helped in the engagement process of our middle school admissions for District 2. Um, however, as a parent going through trying to get the application for 3K, it's interesting that I had to find out from this hearing, from enrollment, that the application went live. I'm on the email listserv that is supposed to be providing parents all the information. I greatly appreciate the um, specifications of the different programs available to parents. Um, but the fact that we've had zero dates of when this application was going to go live and when that was gonna close, we talk about uplifting 3K or why these seats are empty. I wanna tell you why they're empty. They're empty because there's zero outreach going on for the past year and a half. And I say the past year and a half because I know families that got into even early learn um, through outreach in their districts. And let me tell you, I just found out that I've qualified for early learn for the past year. I've been trying to look for work, but childcare has been the biggest hindrance in that. And to, to find out from a provider, mind you, because the DOE's Sorry, website might be May I please continue just this? Yes, you may continue. Thank you. The My Schools app, and like I said, I live in this space. So imagine parents that don't have the time, the energy, or the resources, nor speak this English as a native language. But I've been on top of DOE. I speak to my superintendent. No information. It was, as far as calendar events, everything that they spoke about at this hearing earlier today, it was information coming January 2023 for 3K and pre-K. Yet these are the seats that are being threatened. These are the seats that they claim are not being filled. They're not being filled because a parent like myself that for the past year I have emailed CC applications regarding early learn, which is the extended day and extended learn as a 3K, which is only eligible to specific families that meet an income threshold 
that is not advertised or not posted anywhere. So I'm finding out yesterday, I only found out because the CC applications after several emails finally got back to me and said, they gave me 3K information. Oh, it's gonna go live sometime this week. I said, I don't want 3K, that's September, 2023. I need something now. There are families and there are seats available. There are seats available, but how are families supposed to utilize them if there's zero outreach going on and they don't make it easy? It's not. I had to find out from this hearing that the application was live. That's absurd. Come on. Forums are not until tomorrow and next week, yet the application's already live. And I get that it's not first come, first serve, but middle schools, high school applications, even kindergarten applications, uh, got information in a timely manner, you knew well in advance when the application was going to go live. And the fact that there's zero information on how to access these early education seats that are empty for families that actually are eligible for them, but there's no way to get access to it is ridiculous. Um, there needs to be more transparency in that, and it shouldn't take years of emails not being responded to and finally getting a response this week only because they thought that they could answer me with the generic 3K email that I got last Friday from the email subscription that didn't, didn't state today was the day the application was gonna go to live. Um, I, yeah, I, I, there's a lot more and I will send you my written testimony regarding GNT and middle school and high school admissions and the impact on students with disabilities, students in temporary housing, multilingual learners, um, and I, I beg you to take a look at the fact that they're really, there are, there are, there are families that need those three K seats and they need to get that information out to the families. This it's not working. I could tell you firsthand and I live in this space. It's not working. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before moving on, there are two Chen Quags logged um, onto the Zoom. Uh, if you could please just log on once um, so we know who to unmute. And if these are two different people, could we, you please email your name to um, testimony at council.nyc.gov um, for the second Chen Quag, if it's somebody different. Moving on to our next panelist. Casey Cohn. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Okay. I have a student in third grade at a gifted and talented elementary school and a student in seventh grade at a large zoned middle school, both in Manhattan District 2. I support the return of screened admissions to some middle schools without leaving that decision in our superintendent's discretion. A screened middle school would have better served my seventh graders academic needs and I would like my third grader to have the choice to apply to screened middle schools. I also request the immediate creation of accelerated classes in additional subjects in zoned middle schools. Our school offers accelerated math in sixth and seventh grade, but nothing for students who need more challenge in other subjects. This year, all of the parent elected members of our school leadership team have asked the school to create an honors ELA class, but our District 2 superintendent has refused to allow it. That is not listening to and incorporating community feedback. I'm not alone in these opinions. Not every parent wants these options, but many do, and there's no reason we can't offer choices that appeal to everyone. Instead, we're allowing extremists to drive families who want their children taught in ability-grouped middle school classes out of the public school system. Before screen schools were eliminated, most of the families at our G&T Elementary chose public middle schools. The year screens were eliminated, were eliminated, about half the families we knew either moved to private school or left New York City altogether for middle school. This year, I believe about two thirds of the school's families will exit the public school system for middle school. These parents aren't racist. Most of us chose public school in the first place because we value diversity. 
but fast learners need accelerated schools and classes. And if forced to choose between a diverse New York City public school that does not meet our kids' academic needs and a private or suburban school that does, most parents are choosing the latter if they can. And it isn't just gifted students being chased out of the public school system. Our good friends pulled their sixth grader out of a small middle school that under screening had been known for working well with students with learning differences, which he has. But the lottery placed a number of advanced learners there and his parents didn't want him targeted when these students were frustrated with him for holding them back. Other friends with a shy daughter who performs in the middle of her elementary school class just bought a house in Westchester because they fear she will be lost in a middle school class with students performing at so many different levels. Not everybody personally likes screened schools or ability grouped right. classes, but many of the people who each of you Time is supposed but many of the people who each of you is supposed to represent do. And providing those choices doesn't require you or anyone else to choose them. If you care about families returning to the public school system, if you want families to feel like they have a viable public school option in New York City, please give us the choices we're asking for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shen Kwok. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Joseph and members of the committee. My name is Chen Kwok. I'm a parent of two New York City government school students. I'm a parent elected member of uh, CC District 2. My comments are my own, and I just want to highlight, uh, thank you for staying, uh, Chair Joseph, but I really find it disrespectful that uh, parents uh, are facing an empty chamber without any committee members and we're forced to speak um, around pickup time and not allowed to use the full day. Uh, I hope that in the future, we can be, you know, the community can be more respectful to, to parents and prioritize us to speak above, um, you know, professional um, nonprofit, you know, executives and activists. Uh, my testimony is that one educational goal that I haven't heard mentioned today from any elected and DOE officials is academic excellence. Only 30% of black and Hispanic students are grade level proficiency. And students are being allowed to graduate from high school below grade level, which sets them up for failure in future education and careers. At the same time, high achieving students who are in every neighborhood, in every borough, are not being supported. The singular focus of elected officials and DOE leadership need to be on improving academic achievement for all students. Lottery admissions are useful when there are ties between students with similar qualifications. Otherwise, lotteries are antithetical to academic achievement. We rightfully have screening for special needs and IEPs, English language learners, and now for dyslexia to provide appropriate support for the learning needs for these student populations. But why do elected officials and chancellor banks ignore students with advanced learning needs, including twice exceptional students, and especially those from low-income disadvantaged homes? There was a time when gifted and academically matched programs were in most schools across New York City. One outcome, which the SDAG conveniently ignores, was Brooklyn Tenthill High School, a specialized high school and the largest high school in the country, having more than 50% Black and Hispanic students for more than 20 consecutive years. These programs were cut, killed off over the past 25 years, and we see the negative consequences today. A lot of admissions put high achieving students in classrooms with other students who may have a two to three year grade level difference. A classroom filled by lottery students with only one teacher means the teacher will always focus his or her time on the students who are below grade level, leaving the high achieving students to his or her or her, or her own devices. High achieving students will not quote unquote be fine. High achieving students who are not supported often display disruptive behavior, depression and loss of motivation. Lotteries also invalidates and disrespects the efforts by students who have demonstrated academic achievement through their efforts in overcoming hardships and challenges. Students who lost the lottery of being born into wealthy families with supportive family parents should not be subjected to yet another lottery for education. We need more academically matched classrooms in every school in every neighborhood across the city Time because high-achieving students are everywhere 
and need to be supported. Please stop ignoring them and wasting their potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you to everybody on the panel. We'll now hear from our final panel, Nikos Papagiorgio, Gavin Healy, Derek Tan, and Maud Marone. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe that the new admissions process are a disaster. I did not elect Mayor Adams or you guys so Superintendent McGuire can implement his personal plan for D2 that, unlike most districts, includes zero screen middle school seats and in addition has no plan for honor CLA. I elected you so that the chancellor directs Mr. McGuire what to do based on the mayor's excellence driven promises and have Mr. McGuire execute. It is unbelievable to me that the chancellor allowed the superintendents to do whatever they wanted after listening to the parents. Why? The parents have already spoken by electing the mayor and you guys for your excellence driven educational initiatives. All parents want the exact same thing. These are neighborhood schools and options to address every kid's educational needs, low and high, from the underperformance to ELL, ICT, to the overperformance. It's not rocket science. Many of the DOE keep talking like school integration is the most important issue for all families. However, during his November 17th Washington Post interview, Chancellor Banks said the following, and I quote, when I talk to families across the city, black families, nobody ever talks to me about integrated schools, not even once. It is not what they talk about. I guess for one more time, the DOE administrators know better what the family priorities of the black families are than the black families themselves. I find this insulting and so should you. Mr. McGuire might have great intentions, but unfortunately, as they say, the road to hell is paved with great intentions. Mr. McGuire's misguided educational opinions are driven by social justice and not excellence. So he suffers from selective hearing when he comes to listening to the parents. Therefore, the chancellor's plan is no good. A ship cannot be driven by consensus. I'm asking the captain of the DOE ship, Chancellor Banks, to come up with a uniform best practices plan for all schools in all districts driven by, as promised, excellence, and not people's unfounded beliefs and feelings. Excellence in education needs to be rewarded again and not be frowned upon as a measure of privilege. We need to stop taking the overperformance educational taxes as so vividly illustrated by the famous equality I'm versus fired. equity slide. It works in minor league baseball games, but not in education. Please give me 20 more seconds. This excellence driven uniform plan should include, but not limited to, seats in screen schools as a percentage of the district students. A 10% number sounds fair to me. Accelerated classes in math and ELA in every school and every grade. Same district priority in all districts and reasonable number of DIA seats per school. 10% sounds fair to me and not, as an example, an infuriating 50% 50% currently at uh, Eleanor Roosevelt High School. Thank you very much. My name is Nikos Papa Giorgio, and I'm the father of a Bronx Science High School and a Wagner Middle School senior. Thank you for your testimony, Gavin Healy. Um, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair Joseph. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, first of all, I want to comment on the DOE Director of Enrollment's remark that Place NYC is an organization the DOE has partnered with on outreach. This is an organization founded and led by some virulently transphobic people, and their vicious anti-trans activism is well documented. That the DOE would partner with such a group 
is an affront to the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community and calls into question the DOE's commitment to the safety and well being of its LGBTQ students. One of my long running frustrations with our system is how we spend so much time in CEC meetings, in Chancellor's Town Halls, and in hearings like this one, talking about how to rank and sort kids, while we seem to spend far less time talking about how to actually educate them. Personally, as the parent of a fifth grader who just submitted a middle school application, I'm in full support of the elimination of admission screening for middle schools and high schools. My child attends a school in District 2, where after a thorough and thoughtful process of multilingual community engagement, our district superintendent, Kelly McGuire, made the decision to eliminate middle school admission screens. This was a huge relief to my family. And this thoughtful process of community engagement by our superintendent was especially important when many of our CSC members in District 2, including the president and vice president of the council, regularly treat families who come to CEC meetings with bias and abuse, particularly directed to those of us who are parents of students with disabilities, leaving many of us fearful of bringing our concerns to our CEC representatives and making a mockery of the Chancellor's pillar of community engagement. As the parent of a smart, curious, and hardworking fifth grader who happens to have an IEP, I'm already worn out by going through assistive technology evaluations, neuropsych assessments, and all the other hoops the DOE makes us jump through to get services. So the elimination of middle school screens in District 2 saved us a tremendous, a tremendous amount of time and stress, and I'm grateful for that. I believe that the DOE should follow this lead and eliminate admission screens across the board. Kids apply to middle school in the fifth grade when they're just nine or 10 years old. They shouldn't be subjected to a competitive admissions process that separates them into rigid boxes at that age, especially when we've seen how admission screens have contributed to the segregation of our schools by race and socioeconomic status. Also, when we've seen how screen schools have done such a poor job of supporting English language learners. Thank you, time has expired. Sorry, I'm, I'm just about to wrap up, thank you. And students with disabilities, like my child. I think we need to reconsider what we mean by a successful school. Is the public school really successful if it screens out most of the public? It's discouraging to see our school system time and again take the easy road of exclusion rather than the hard path to true inclusive excellence. Please, let's eliminate admission screens once and for all. They're a deeply regressive tax on New York City families. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Derek Tan. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you, Chair Joseph, for staying. My name is Derek Tan. I'm the proud parent of two children who attend public schools in District 2. I'm also the proud product of a public school education myself. And in addition, I've been an educator for 20 years, having served for the last 10 as the director of a graduate program that is widely considered to be one of the top in its field. Our program also has a strong and visible commitment to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion through targeted recruitment efforts, innovative programming and policies, and hard work. As a result, we have a strong track record of recruiting and training students from diverse and underserved backgrounds. For example, our program includes students from federally designated underrepresented minority groups at levels that are double the national average. These students are leaders in the field and have gone on to successful careers across the nation and around the world. It's with this perspective that I must express grave concern about the diversity and admissions policy for high schools, specifically in District 2. While well-intentioned, this is an ill-conceived policy that will ultimately harm all students in District 2. The policy has an obvious fatal flaw that will drastically damage our schools in the process undermining the goals of the policy itself. Because of its astoundingly large quotas, with up to 75% of seats at some District 2 schools reserved for low-income students, this policy unfairly penalizes middle-class students who are high-performing but do not qualify for free or reduced-price lunch. Families who are unable to obtain appropriate high school placements for their children based on merit will then leave the public school system. As a result, District 2 will lose financial support based on enrollment, tax dollars, and direct donations. This will lead to an irreversible death spiral for our public schools. 
From my two decades of experience as an educator, I know well that there are students from underserved backgrounds who have tremendous potential, and I have implemented holistic admissions policies effectively and fairly to serve those students. In contrast, the massive quotas that District 2 has implemented are unfair, ineffective, naive, and with all due respect, intellectually lazy. I urge DOE in the strongest terms to discontinue this harmful policy immediately. Instead, seek out other creative, effective, and equitable solutions to improve public school education for all students in District 2 and across New York City. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, our last witness is Maud Marin. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. My name is Maud Marin, and I am the parent of four children in New York City public schools. I have served on the school leadership teams and parent associations of my children's elementary, middle, and high schools. I am the past president of CEC District 2, and I'm also the co-president of the education advocacy organization Place NYC which is a collective of elected parent leaders dedicated to improving academic standards and curriculum for all New York City public students in all our public schools. I'm speaking now as a public school mom. New York City DOE managed schools have hemorrhaged enrollment in the past three years with more than 10% of our student population exiting the system. While COVID and school closures undoubtedly had an impact, the declining enrollment cannot be chalked up to the pandemic because parochial, charter, and private schools in our city saw an increase in applications during the same period. The changes in admissions played an outsized role in the departures. Parents are frustrated with lowered standards and the anti-merit admissions policies affecting over 100, 150,000 students in fifth and eighth grade each year and an admissions process that is confusing and chaotic. My three eldest children are class of 2024, 2026, and 2028. And the application process for all three, for middle school and for two high school application uh, seasons, changed dramatically for each child, each time, all in the service of ever elusive and constantly changing equity goals, and never with the results of making our schools more rigorous or our students better educated. Merit and talent-based admissions help create some of New York City's best public schools that have successfully educated generations of New Yorkers. Members of this committee should stand with parents who have repeatedly asked the DOE to reject the lowering of standards in the name of equity and instead create true equity for public school students by providing rigorous academics, accelerated curriculum, and merit-based admissions which allow all children to reach their highest potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, this concludes our virtual testimony. If there's anybody else who is on Zoom who would like to testify, if you could please use the raise hand feature. Thank you so much. I'm not seeing any hands. And that is all. Thank you all. This concludes our hearing. Thank you.